Number 10, Draculina. To be clear, when we talk about heroes you've never heard of, we're more talking about those that sit on the outskirts of the superhero fandoms. So you won't find them likely on the big screen or on DC's or Marvel's main teams like the Justice League, Avengers, or the X-Men. Instead, these are heroes who come from a more humble background by comparison. Some of them may have been simply forgotten due to just how long they've been around, whereas others typically are associated with smaller or even in some cases now defined defunct publishers. Coming from the world of fellow indie hero Vampirella, Draculina is sort of Ella's adopted sister and also kind of her ex-lover or ex-one night stand. There have actually been at least two different Draculinas, possibly three at this point. One is Lilith's biological daughter and the biological twin sister of Vampy who is blonde. The other one, the one I'm focusing on, who was once Vampy's lover, became obsessed with her and was eventually adopted by Lilith to become the new Draculina. If you want to learn more about her and other Vampy adjacent characters, Sacred Six is a pretty cool comic that I would recommend that you check out. Or you can learn more about this version of Draculina in the 2019 Vampirella series from Dynamite. Both of those series, by the way, are by Christopher Priest. Both Draculinas go by the name Victory, although the one we're talking about here was originally named Victoria, but the two do differ in terms of appearance and, like I said, blood relation. <laughs> blood relation in this context almost becomes a vampire pun. This new Draculina isn't exactly a vampire, by the way, but is armed with a demonic ring that basically grants her power similar to one, allowing her to accurately play the part. Draculina is currently a property of Dynamite Comics. Number 9, Tony Chu. Tony Chu is a quirky and unique character, but still is ultimately a hero. And he even technically is superpower, so he would qualify as a superhero. Tony is a detective who possesses the unique power of sebopathy. Whatever he eats, except for beets, he gains in-depth knowledge of. Being able to tell where all the ingredients that make it up came from, being able to taste everything about that ingested food. Tony uses this skill to basically solve murders mainly, sometimes even ingesting parts of victims or the accused, sometimes even ingesting parts of the victims or the suspects to learn more about the case and help solve it. He initially worked for the Philadelphia Police Department, but ultimately gets fired after they witness him eating part of a deceased suspect. He later is hired by the FDA. Number 8, Red Sonja. One of my favorite lesser known heroes is Red Sonja. Red Sonja comes to us from the less sci-fi, more fantasy based world of sword and sorcery. She is an extremely gifted fighter, marksman, and sword bearer. Red Sonja, the she-devil, is said to have been given her name for well, many different reasons. One such story as to how she got her name is that she left to seek out adventure and her fortune and became a mercenary, earning the name Red because of all the blood that she spilled. Red Sonja, while not a traditional hero, pretty much always stands up to those who are cruel and corrupt, often fighting for those who are oppressed, even against her better judgement. She has even fought death before in combat and won, allowing her to live on when she was on the brink of death. Red Sonja was once a character from the Marvel Comics wheelhouse, but currently calls Dynamite Comics her home. Number 7, Vampirella. But you can call her Vampy. Vampirella isn't a conventional hero by any means, but she definitely tries to do what's best by folks while still being a vampire from outer space, and at the same time with ties to Lilith and Hell. Overall, she's both complicated and also kind of super simple, and it's that weird blend of those two very different elements that I love about her. Vampy being an intergalactic vampire is super strong, fast, can fly because she actually has wings, and also has been shown to have access to advanced technology at times due to her ties to the planet Draculon. Vampirella is currently attached to Dynamite Comics, but was originally a property of Warren Publishing. Number 6, Savage Dragon. Savage Dragon is a popular hero as far as the lesser known or indie heroes go, so if you haven't heard of him before, you might want to check him out. Initially, his origins were a mystery. All we knew was that he was a humanoid, green skinned, dragon like character who decided to fight as a police officer and hero, fighting against the criminal and mutant super freaks of Chicago. That's also in part because Savage Dragon initially had really bad amnesia in the comics, so he didn't actually even remember his own origin story at the time. Savage Dragon hails from Image Comics and was a originally introduced as simply Dragon before being known under the mantle of Savage Dragon. His powers include super strength and super healing. Number 5, Witchblade. Witchblade is a hero who comes from Top Cow Productions. Mainly we've known Witchblade as Sarah Pizzini, but the Witchblade has belonged to many other powerful women throughout the years. The Witchblade is an ancient mystical artifact that typically binds itself to a host who can then wield and use its powers at will. It can be more or less powerful depending on the host, but in this case since Sarah is one of the most well known hosts of of the Witchblade, we're gonna basically base the ranking on her abilities. The Witchblade can be used to summon mystical armor, which can cover the 
the entirety of its host body. Though typically most are not skilled enough to actually summon that much armor, and instead are usually only covered in little pieces of armor as a result. Hence why you see that witch blade art and she's like, not really covered in much. This armor grants the wearer invulnerability, but even if its host is harmed, it also grants the power to heal. Aside from creating armor, the witch blade can also be used to create weapons on the fly. It also increases its host's strength and endurance. Sarah herself was also a trained NYPD detective prior to becoming the host for the witch blade, so she also brings her skills as an officer and detective to the table. Number 4. Luther Strode Luther Strode is the main character in the Strange Talent of Luther Strode series, a series that hails from Image Comics. Luther ends up acquiring powers that enhance his strength, durability, speed, and combat skills after receiving a mail order exercise program known as the Hercules Method. Luther's powers, however, only create more harm than good in his life and lead to a lot of death, much of it happening as a result of his own involvement. Try as he might to try and do good with it. While not a conventional hero, Luther definitely fits the bill of an anti hero or more accurately, tragic hero archetype, with everything going awry, no matter his intent. He's also someone I would personally love to see take on the hero who made our number two spot. Number three, Radiant Black. Radiant Black is Nathan Burnett, or was Nathan Burnett. Nathan to start, anyways. Going to try not to spoil this series because it's one that I think we should all be reading, so I'm just gonna leave it at Nathan for now. Radiant Black is the first hero we meet in this series. In issue number one, Nathan ends up getting the powers of the Black Radiant, which basically means he has the powers of a black hole. Radiant Black can manipulate gravity and also becomes super dense with this power set. The downside for this hero is being new it means that he's pretty inexperienced in the comics thus far. However, gravity manipulation manipulation as a power set is insane, which is how he ranks so high up on this list despite his inexperience. Radiant Black hails from Image Comics, and like I said, if you have not checked out this series and gotten to know the Radiance yet, well, you definitely need to change that and you need to do so. It's like Power Rangers, but possibly cooler, and I say that having much respect and much love for Power Rangers. So that's not a snub at all, it's just like, it's really good. Number 2. Bulletproof You know Invincible, but do you know Bulletproof? Fans of the comic series likely do, but if you just became an Invincible fan via the animated series, then this isn't a character that you'd be familiar with just yet. After all, at this point we've only had one season so far, so it's very likely Bulletproof will appear in the series just not until a bit later on. Bulletproof is Zandel Rudolph. He got his powers as a result of his brother using him as basically a science experiment, as his brother Tyrone was actually obsessed with superpowers. Zandel would end up getting powers as a result of this mad science, while his brother would end up dead. Bulletproof also goes on to take up the invincible mantle at one point, filling in for Mark when he is off world. Zandel's powers are based on energy absorption, which I think is one of the strongest power sets to have personally. Bulletproof, like other heroes in the Invincible universe, Universe comes to us from Skybound, which is an imprint of Image Comics. Number one, the darkness. The darkness is an ancient elemental force that takes up residence in a host, granting them special powers. One of the most famous hosts that we have come to know as the darkness is Jackie Estacado. The powers that Jackie wields are similar to what you'd expect from some kind of demonic force. They're also honestly comparable to Venom's power set from Marvel Comics. At least I see a lot of similarities there. The darkness gives you access to a sort of mystical armor. Which which can be summoned at will. It also grants the user a healing factor, shapeshift abilities, and through them also the ability to fly via wings that you can create. Jackie as the darkness can also create dark tendrils, which he can also turn into weapons, and he can also summon entities known as darklings. While more of an anti-hero due to his methods, Jackie as Staccato is still a hero in the sense that he generally fights on the side of good. The darkness hails from Top Cow Productions. And if you do know the Witchblade, you probably know the darkness, or vice versa. Number 10, Wind. Wind is the name of the main character from this self titled series, also, of course, named Wind. It comes from Boom Studios and was written by James Tinney IV, with art by Michael Dalyanos. Wind is a teenage hero who has always hidden the truth of his elven and magical heritage as a weird blood. His heritage grants him great power, power he's been hiding from his whole life in an attempt to fit in, being made to believe that magic is dangerous and basically 
basically turns people into monsters or in some other way corrupts them. When he becomes too old to hide his pointed ears and who he is any longer, he is forced to either try and change or embrace who he really is. And in order to protect his friends against those who would hunt both him and them down, Wind ultimately embraces his magical side, unleashing powerful abilities. Wind has wings, can fly, and can communicate with forests like spirits or sprites. He also has, like many other teen heroes, the power of friendship, which usually means he ends up making friends with powerful allies. I would say if you love the world of Avatar, you might also end up falling in love with both the character Wind and his series. It reminds me of Avatar at least, in like the best way. Number 9. Lord Fanny Lord Fanny is Hilda Morales, who was born as a boy but raised as a girl. She is a transsexual woman and one of the first trans heroes in comics. Lord Fanny was raised as a girl by her grandmother because only women in their culture could become witches and her grandmother was a powerful witch who wanted to pass on her knowledge and power to Fanny. Although Fanny herself did choose to be a girl, if that makes sense. Lord Fanny is a member of the Invisibles team and was created by writer Grant Morrison and artist Steve Yoel. The Invisibles was a comic series that existed as part of DC's Vertigo imprint back when it was around. I miss Vertigo so much. The series began in 1994 and in issue 13 we would learn more about Lord Fanny's origins and her very tragic backstory. Lord Fanny's such a cool character. Number 8. Quantum and Woody You may have heard of Valiant's character Bloodshot who recently got his own solo film, but what about all of their other superheroes? Quantum and Woody is a series and superhero duo from Valiant Comics. It was inspired by the superhero team up series Power Man and Iron Fist, but is a lot more bizarre. The series itself was written by Christopher Priest with art actually by the artist who did Power Man and Iron Fist. Pretty cool. Quantum and Woody are adoptive brothers who, after years of being estranged, are brought back together when their father mysteriously dies. While trying to figure out what really happened to him, they stumble upon superpowers. The catch? They must touch their power bands at least once every 24 hours to not only keep their powers, but also keep from losing their lives as well, as they would then no longer exist if they didn't touch their band. Quantum's powers are more defense based, while Woody's are more offensive. Oh, and they also kind of have an animal sidekick, Vincent Van Goat, who is even more bizarre than he already sounds. Just trust me, I don't want to spoil anything, but Vincent Van Goat. What a goat. Number 7. Josephine More commonly referred to as Joe, Josephine is the main character and hero of the Fatal series. More commonly referred to as Joe, Josephine is the main character and hero of the Fatal series, which comes to us from Image Comics. Fatal is a supernatural noir style comic created by the brilliant team up of writer Ed Brubaker and artist Sean Phillips. Seriously, I love these two together. Some might argue that Joe isn't really a hero as she's, well, she's a little bit selfish, but in focusing on uncovering the mysteries of her own power and in trying to save herself, she does inevitably save others, in the long run at least. There are a lot of people that end up being sacrificed along the way in order for Joe to stand a chance in defeating her enemies in the end. And also there are just straight up people being sacrificed along the way by her enemies who are attempting to track her down. So yeah, she, she kind of also gets a lot of people killed, but you know. It's not her fault! Joe's powers allow her to control all men who gaze upon her, with them being irresistibly attracted to her no matter who they are and no matter if she wants to influence them or not. Unless of course they are able to protect themselves against her influence with extremely powerful magic, which we only see from a couple characters really in the series. In other words, her power is pretty freaking strong. The only downside here, which is kind of the crux of it all, is that she can't fully control her powers, that is, she can't turn them off when she wants to, which ends up causing a lot of problems for Joe along the way, but I won't spoil any of that. Anyways, if you haven't read Fatal, it's now, I think, we're, it's gonna be 10 years old soon, so go and read it, hurry up! Came out I think in 2012. That's when it started. Number 6. King Mob King Mob is the leader of the Invisibles. He was once a horror writer who wrote under the pen name Kit Morrison. As the series The Invisibles is created by Grant Morrison, Mob is believed to be sort of a fictional stand-in for Morrison himself. King Mob's legal name was Gideon Starozowski, and he struggles with his alter persona, especially troubled by how violent he, as King Mob, can be. King Mob is not only a leader who wields power in that sense, because he's a leader, but also has experience experience with firearms and weapons, is a skilled martial artist and fighter, is psychic, can time travel, and employs the use of chaos magic. So lots of cool things that he can do. Also if you haven't read The Invisibles, it is really trippy. Go read it. If you like The Matrix, you'll probably like The Invisibles. If you like The Matrix and if you like 
Doom Patrol, which of course is also Grant Morrison. Not The Matrix, Doom Patrol. Number five, Laura Wilson slash Persephone. Laura Wilson is the main character of the Wicked and the Divine series from Image Comics. The series was created by writer Kieran Gillen and artist Jamie McKelvey. In this story, gods come to life cyclically being kind of reincarnated. This is known as the recurrence. Laura herself is obsessed with the gods and the pantheon who are all of course re-emerging at the time. She wants nothing more than to be a god herself. At least that is what she thinks she wants until her wishes kind of come true. She is revealed to be Persephone who is believed to be the final god to return during the recurrence. As Persephone she can summon plants and vines and control them. She also seems to have some kind of control or influence over the underworld. Lori can also create fireballs and reveal to others past events, summoning visions of the past even if she was not present for those events. Number 4 Sludge Sludge is a hero or anti-hero who comes to us initially from Malibu comics and was created by writer Steve Gerber and artist Aaron Lepresti. Sludge was once Frank Hogue, a dirty NYPD police officer who accepted bribes in exchange for favors when it came to drug dealings. He was ordered by the crime boss he worked for, John Paul Marcello, to kill another likely dirtier cop. When Frank refused Marcello's request, Marcello had him killed instead. After being shot, a grenade went off, knocking him into a bucket of chemical waste. Who put that chemical waste there? The waste would merge with him after he was dumped into the sewers, turning him into the super heroic monstrosity Sludge. Sludge possesses a healing factor and super strength. He could also kill or mutate his opponents with just a touch. Kind of turns them into sludge. It's pretty. It's pretty dark, really. Number three, Radiant Yellow. We don't know that much about the newest Radiants, but we do know that they seem interested in protecting innocent people from whatever craziness is currently going on. Okay, hard to keep talking about all of this Radiant Black series without spoiling anything, but I'm once again, I'm gonna I'm try my best. Radiant Yellow appears to be an older gentleman, and as far as I know, we don't really know his name yet. What we do know is that each Radiant seems to have their own power set. At least that's what we're being led to believe by the story and the imagery you. Used. It hasn't exactly all been laid out yet, which is honestly kind of what makes this series so much fun. There's so much we don't know. The mystery of it all. Radiant Yellow, however, seems to have powers based in perhaps light manipulation. To me, that's what it looks like the force blasts that they emit are based in. And it also looks to me like they can perhaps manipulate light to create illusions. That's just based on the imagery that's surrounding them in the comics. Like the other Radiants, Yellow isn't too experienced and doesn't seem to understand the full extent of their powers just yet. Radiant Yellow comes to us from the Radiant Black series, which belongs to Image Comics and is written by Kyle Higgins, who yes, was also the initial writer of the Power Rangers series, and it was also created by artist Marcelo Costa. Number 2, Exo Manowar. Valiant Comics actually has a whole stable and universe filled with supers, including this one here, Exo Manowar. Exo Manowar is actually the name of the sentient armor that is tied to our hero in this series, Arik of Dacia, a Visigoth from the 5th century AD. Our Arik would end up being abducted by aliens and enslaved for years before he managed to escape. Arik learned of where his captive's armory was kept and basically ended up getting there and then getting the Exo Man of War suit. He then bonded with the suit and used that advanced tech to escape his captors. However, due to interstellar travel, by the time he arrived back on Earth, it was now the 20th century, basically modern day. Arik would have to adjust to this very different world and along the way would meet other superheroes from the Valiant Universe. That's right, there's not just two more, there's a whole bunch of them. Exo Manowar is a character created by writers Jim Shooter, Steve Englehart, and as well as artists Bob Layton and Barry Windsor Smith. Number 1 Black Hammer Black Hammer is Joe Weber, the title character of the Black Hammer series, written by Jeff Lemire, with artwork by the amazing Dean Ormston. The Black Hammer series was made to be completely different from other more traditional superhero comics, but if I did have to compare Black Hammer to anyone from that more conventional world, I would liken him to Thor myself. Joe Weber inherited the hammer and powers of the former Black Hammer when he died, being transported to the realm of New World as soon as he himself had picked up the fallen hammer. There he learned that he was meant to become the new Black Hammer, replacing the fallen one as Starlock's new and most powerful warrior in the fight against Starlock's evil twin, the Anti-God. While being the title character, Black Hammer isn't actually the main character of this series. As we learn near the end of issue number one, Black Hammer sacrificed himself to save the world from the Anti-God and keep his fellow superheroes and friends alive. But what really happened to him, and just how and why are his teammates now seemingly trapped in the timeless and kind of 
eerie town of Rockwood? Well, to find out, you'll have to read on, true believers. But honestly, you should just go read Black Hammer because it's pretty great. Everyone go read all the Black Hammer things. It's like a whole universe now. Number 10, Daredevil. No, not that Daredevil. This Daredevil is Bart Hill, who witnessed his father's murder before the killer branded him with a hot iron, making him mute with shock. He learned to become an expert boomerang thrower and became a costumed crime fighter. He was later rendered unmute with no explanation and honestly isn't that interesting. He actually appeared after Superman, but fell into the public domain and has therefore been used by several different publishers, although they often change his name Name to avoid conflicts with the Marvel legal team. Number 9, Miss Fury. First appearing in 1941 in newspaper strips published by Bell Syndicate, Marla Drake was a wealthy socialite who was attending a party when she discovered that another woman was wearing the same outfit as her. In order to prevent embarrassment, she changed into a ceremonial panther skin outfit that her uncle had taken from Africa and willed to her. The suit of course granted her superpowers, which she used to fight crime and achieve a level of cultural appropriation most white people can only dream of. Talk about my culture is not a costume. Her powers are basic acrobatic, climbing and fighting powers, and she was known for using her claws and whip against her enemies. She actually didn't use the suit very often, as her manservant, a Brazilian albino Indian named Albino Joe, Jesus Christ. Well, he warned her that every favor that was gained through black magic would result with two misfortunes. Her comic strip appearances were later compiled by the company that would one day become Marvel, Timely Comics. This has made the rights to her a little hard to follow, as she is considered canon to the Marvel Universe, but also has appeared in comics published by both Malibu and Dynamite Comics. What makes her notable is that Miss Fury was the first female superhero to actually be created by a woman. All right, that's all of the characters who you could argue were part of the golden age. From here on out, all of the entries were created before Superman first appeared in June 1938. Number 8, Doc Savage. Doc Savage, the man of bronze, first appeared in Doc Savage magazine number 1 in 1933, five whole years before Superman. He appeared in pulp magazines, which would tell the stories of the character in prose with some illustrations, rather than in a purely visual medium as comics would end up doing later. In 2016, Stan Lee actually went on record as saying that Doc Savage was the forerunner to modern superheroes as we know them. Doc Savage's story is that his father assembled a group of scientists who were all experts in their fields to train his son almost from birth to make him a perfect human specimen who is at peak human condition and is a master martial artist and scientist, physician, inventor, explorer, and detective. He was raised in the jungle where he received a really intense tan, earning him the nickname the Man of Bronze. After his father was killed, he decided decided to devote himself to fighting crime, traveling the world and battling criminals. He is extremely rich and has a base in the Arctic that he calls the Fortress of Solitude. He is aided by a team of friends known as the Fabulous Five, who are all experts in their scientific fields, but of course not as expert as Doc Savage is. In his third appearance in 1933, Quest of the Spider, he is referred to as a Superman by one of his colleagues. Doc Savage has appeared in pulp novels, radio stories, and movies over the years, but isn't nearly as well known as the hero he inspired. He has made comic appearances for both Marvel, DC, and Dark Horse over the years. Number 7, The Green Hornet. This is a character you are likely at least aware of due to the Seth Rogen movie and the classic 60s television show starring Bruce Lee, but The Green Hornet's history goes back even further than that. First appearing in his own radio series in 1936, The Green Hornet is really Britt Reed, the owner of the Daily Sentinel newspaper. At night, The Green Hornet fights evil with the help of his driver, Kato in their supercar, the Black Beauty. What makes the Hornet unique is that he pretends to be a criminal so that he can infiltrate the various gangs of his city in order to take them down. In a fun bit of lore building, Britt's father is actually Dan Reed Jr., the nephew of the Lone Ranger. The Green Hornet made the jump from radio to the big screen in 1940, appearing in two serials, The Green Hornet and The Green Hornet Strikes Again. He appeared from time to time in his own comic book series, which adapted his radio stories, but his most iconic appearance was in the 1966 television show, which starred Van Williams as the Hornet and Bruce Lee as Kato. The show was made by the same team who made the 60s Batman show, but employed a more serious tone than the campy Batman show. It lasted for one season, but has managed to stay in the public consciousness, being the main inspiration for the 2011 film. The license for Green Hornet comics is currently with Dynamite Comics, who have taken him back to his Depression-era roots. If you want to familiarize yourself with the Hornet's sting, might I recommend Chuck Wagner 
Eggner's Green Hornet Gear 1. Number 6, The Shadow. <laughs> Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? <laughs> the Shadow knows! First created in 1930, The Shadow was originally the narrator of the Detective Story Hour radio program, which was created to help boost the sales of Detective Story magazine. People began asking the newsstand vendors for uh, that Shadow Detective magazine, and the publishers decided to develop an actual character for the narrator and give him his own pulp magazine series. The Shadow Magazine, which by 1937 received its own radio series. There was some inconsistencies between the character in the radio program and magazine appearances, so we'll go with the more well-known version of the story. The Shadow is a man who has traveled the world and learned how to cloud men's minds and become invisible, hiding in the shadows to attack criminals. He has taken over the life of a wealthy playboy named Lamont Cranston, whose identity he uses to fund his exploits and gather intel from his friend, the police commissioner. If this sounds kinda Batman-y to you, then you would be right, as The Shadow was a major influence on Batman's modus operandi. In fact, The Shadow story, Partners of Peril, was lifted almost verbatim by Bob Kane when he wrote the first Batman story featured in Detective Comics number 27. Both feature the hero investigating a series of murders of a group of businessmen who own a chemical syndicate together. Both feature the hero getting trapped under a glass dome that fills with gas that they then plug with a handkerchief, proving once again that Bob Kane was a talentless hack who would have never been remembered if it weren't for Bill Finger. The Shadow has appeared in pulp magazines and radio dramas and films over the years. His most recent feature film was in 1994, starring Alec Baldwin as the title character. It's actually pretty underrated. The character is currently licensed to Dynamite Comics and has a pretty extensive catalogue of appearances available for readers. Number 5, The Phantom. The Phantom first appeared in comic strips in 1936 in the fictional African country of Bangala after a castaway whose ship was attacked by pirates washed up on shore and was adopted by the locals. He swore revenge on all evildoers and developed the persona of the Ghost Who Walks, otherwise known as the Phantom. The mantle is passed down through generations, with each new Phantom being sworn to protect the jungles of Bangala. The Phantom whose adventures are most commonly followed is Kit Walker, the 21st Phantom. Although his purple costume might come across as silly, he was the first hero to wear skin-tight clothes and a mask which obscured the pupils, leaving only the white eyes, something that is of course a staple of masked superheroes now. He is also known for wearing two rings, one of which he uses to leave a skull-shaped mark on the villains he punches. The Phantom has appeared in comics, novels, serials, and a live-action movie in 1996 starring Billy Zane. Number 4, The Spider. The Spider was created in 1933 to be a direct competitor to The Shadow. He is really millionaire Richard Wentworth, who disguises himself in early appearances by wearing a mask a wig, and a false hunchback. He has no issues with killing his enemies, and always used his ring to leave a spider-shaped mark on his victims' foreheads, so no one but him would be blamed for his actions. He is aided by his manservant, Ram Singh, and is a master of disguise, adopting several aliases in order to infiltrate and gather information. His stories are notable for being extremely violent, with the various villains' death tolls routinely going into the thousands by the end of each story. He was the first pulp hero to be given a live-action serial in 1938, where he was given a new look that featured a red spider web, which helped to distinguish him from the shadow. In the years since his pulp novel appearances, the spider has been featured in comic book series published by Eclipse Comics, Moonstone Books, and Dynamite Entertainment, who adopted Spider's serial costume to the page for the character. Number 3, Black Bat. There are actually two Black Bats. The first from 1933, who was a roaming detective who left bat-themed calling cards, and the more popular one from 1939, who debuted around the same time as Batman. Anthony Anthony Quinn was a district attorney until one day in court someone threw a vial of acid in his face which disfigured and blinded him. Hmm. In the words of Tobey Maguire, it looks very, uh similar. The attack blinded Dent, I mean Quinn, but fortunately a police officer who is dying from gangster's bullets donates his eyes to Quinn. After the surgery, Quinn is not only able to see normally, but can also see in the dark. He becomes a costumed crime fighter who leaves bat-shaped stickers on his victims, so much like the spider, no one else is blamed for his crimes. Because he and Batman hit the stands around the same time, both publishers sued each other, but the editor of DC Comics, Whitney Ellsworth, managed to broker an agreement 
agreement that made both companies leave each other free to publish bat themed stories. Although Batman certainly is the more well remembered of the two. Number 2 Sheena Queen of the Jungle Debuting in January 1938, a full 6 months before Superman, is Sheena, the very first female superhero to receive her own self titled book. Sheena was an orphan who was raised by an African witch doctor who taught her how to survive and various African languages. She grew up in the jungle and learned to communicate with its animals. She eventually becomes friends with a hunter named Bob Reynolds, and the two protect the jungle from giants, dinosaurs, cults, vampire apes, and everything else under the sun. Sheena was co created by Jerry Iger in comics legend Will Eisner and appeared in comics and pulp novels and received her own TV series in 1955 and 2000, and a live action film titled simply Sheena in 1984. She is also the inspiration for both Tina Turner's stage persona and the Ramones song Sheena is a Punk Rocker. Like many of the pre Golden Age heroes on this list, she is currently licensed to Dynamite Entertainment, who released new comics about this classic hero. Number 1 Mandrake the Magician First appearing in newspaper strips in 1934, several historians credit Mandrake, not the Man of Steel, as being the first comic book superhero. He is a stage magician who uses hypnotic gestures to make people see illusions, which he of course also uses to help him fight crime. He has the power to teleport, shapeshift, levitate, and to become invisible. His hat and wand possess great magic and were passed down to him by his father, Theron. He fights both criminals and supernatural threats, aliens, and figures from other dimensions. He is like Zatanna and Doctor Strange rolled into one. Mandrake appeared in comic strips until 2013, but never really had his own comic books, aside from reprints and a few miniseries, one of which was actually released by Marvel. He has guest starred in stories for The Phantom and Flash Gordon, and a series featuring a new character taking up the mantle called Legacy of Mandrake the Magician, which was released in 2020 by Red 5 Comics. He appeared in his own movie serial in 1939, and there have been a few attempts to adapt the character for film and television, but none have panned out. Number 10, Tosin Oduye. Tosin is such a cool character. Okay, so as a kid, Tosin Oduye saw the way that Wakanda became a socially isolated nation who believed themselves superior and seemed to always attract war. The Marube, the tribe Tosin belongs to, began to separate a bit from the main Wakandan people. They hated the way Wakanda used vibranium for tech, so they instead found a way to refine the vibranium and flow with it. They gave themselves vibranium tattoos, and some in their tribe, who trained hard enough, could have the vibranium flow with them. Granting them some pretty cool powers. It's like they harness the energy of vibranium and can use it to move extremely fast, or unleash vibranium energy blasts, or even seemingly grant himself a vibranium armor. Last thing I want to say is that the covers for the issues of this volume of Black Panther are just so cool. Definitely check it out. Number 9 Aleph Chernikov. Aleph Chernikov is a young mutant hero who appears in the Wolverine Patch flashback series by Larry Hama. This was a miniseries that came out earlier in 2022 and covered an untold tale from Patch's adventures in Madripoor back in the good old days. Here Patch works to help three Russian mutants who have escaped their government, but have been tracked to Madripoor. Madripoor is military, royal armed guards, as well as SHIELD and Russia themselves appear to be after the mutants, but Patch, Archie, and Tiger Tiger intervene in hopes of helping the three. In the end they do, and among them is Aleph, the child of the other two mutants, David and Raisa. Aleph appears to be the main focus of everyone efforts when it comes to hunting them down. They possess powerful healing abilities, psionic abilities, and possibly even the power to manipulate reality. But they're also a child, so of course everyone's like, we gotta protect this baby. Number 8, Bitewing. There's nothing that wins me over more than a puppy. But then DC goes and gives a puppy a three-legged, gray, blue-eyed, pimple puppy and gives it to Nightwing, probably one of the best members of the Bat family. And then they go and give it the nickname of Bitewing. I literally teared up just typing this part because of the overload of adorable that I got while looking at this. Haley the dog was being chased and mistreated by some teenagers when Dick Grayson stepped in, rescued, and adopted her. Now, the first sidekick turned full on hero in DC Comics has his very own super pet, especially after she was given a costume and the ability to speak from a fifth dimensional imp. Now, she fights alongside Nightwing as Bitewing, and it's cute. It's very cute. Number seven. 
Escapade. I love Escapade, and I also love her BFF, Morgan Red. While initially introduced as a criminal in the Marvel Voices Pride issue of this year, I think it's safe to say that Escapade and her friend Morgan and his genetically engineered flying turtle pal, Hibbert, will soon become a team of mutant heroes instead of anti heroes. I mean, even if they are criminals who steal stuff, they really only try to steal stuff from the worst people, which makes them still pretty altruistic. Escapade is a trans mutant named Sheila Sexton, whose powers involve swapping places with whoever she decides to use her mutant powers on. This can be someone as low level as a random passerby, or someone as high level as another super powered being who is about to defeat her, or even the President of the United States. So much potential for this power. Number 6 Bolt Since the live action Black Adam movie was announced, DC decided that they would also put out a Black Adam solo series for the first time. And in the first issue, it puts Black Adam on the ropes of mortality. In response to this, Black Adam finds his descendant, Malik Adam White, a medical student living in the Bronx. Basically, Black Adam just tells this guy he is going to succeed Black Adam and inherit his power. And then he forces him by having one of his people pop a cap in Malik, and the only way to save himself is to take Black Adam's ring and say Shazam. While Black Adam calls Malik White Adam, Malik gives a good little lecture about the inherent racism there. So, he prefers to go by Thunderbolt or just straight up Bolt. From what I've read, I really like his character, and he is supposed to represent a sort of form of redemption for the character of Black Adam because, as they say in the comic, there is no true redemption for Black Adam. Not at this point, at least. Number five, Amass. Amass is a really cool new mutant. They made their first appearance in Steve Orlando's Marauder series in issue number four. Amass is a mutant of Threshold, the oldest mutant civilization to have ever existed. They, along with two other mutants, had their minds stored within a codex, hoping that they would arrive in the future after being restored and would be able to seek help for their people who were on the brink of extinction when they last left them in the past. Amass's mutant powers allow them to physically combine mutants and their powers together, joining together to create one basically big ball of mutants, which kind of looks like one big being. Hence their mutant name of Amass. This appears to both psychologically and physically combine whichever mutants they choose with themselves, with their new combined form also possessing all the powers of said mutants, which I think is pretty nuts. Number 4, Grey Wolf. Of the characters I'm talking about on this list, my favorites are absolutely a three-way tie between Tosin, Bitewing, and this guy. Grey Wolf. Okay, so Lex Luthor was running a crime fighting experiment around the world trying to create a group of his own similar to Batman Incorporated, with the ultimate goal of creating Abyss, his own Batman. But then he abandoned all these projects that then went wild doing their own thing. So Batman Incorporated's international team, being led by Ghostmaker, go on a mission to bring them down in Batman 2022 Annual Volume 3, number one from July. Their first mission is to Kazbek Chechnya to take on Grey Wolf. Grey Wolf was unleashed on the city to help its citizens who had been exposed to Lazarus resin that had made them all extremely violent. With Ghostmaker, he was able to cure the residents and join Batman Inc. as a good guy, but he displayed enough skill to best Dark Ranger, El Gaucho, and Batman of Japan in a three-on-one fight, and he beat Wingman one-on-one. -on -one. Also, he's like seven feet tall minimum. Super cool. Number three, Black Mist. Black Mist is a completely new character who is not yet a member of Batman Incorporated, but who might end up becoming one in the future. She was actually one of my favorite characters to appear in Batman Inc. issue number one from 2022. Not only does she look like a badass, but she also seems to be wary of joining up with Batman Inc. Black Mist appears as a sort of consulting detective in issue number one of the third volume of this series. We don't know much about her yet, but she seems to be working with Batman Incorporated to help them solve the mystery behind just who is killing all the teachers of Batman and Ghostmaker, and why and how this perpetrator is doing that. One thing we do know about Black Mist straight out of the gate is that she seems to have history with the Knight. The two recognize each other and are presented as friendly to one another. Number two, Egro the Unbreakable. Okay, so this one definitely took me by a bit of a surprise. Coming out of the 2022 volume of Thunderbolts, specifically issue number two, we are introduced to Egro. Egro is a super interesting little troll looking monster who lives peacefully on Monster Isle. But you see, Egro heard of the monster exhibit 
at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, so naturally he expected to go and see his own statue. He just had to make sure that it captured his true beauty. But what the heck? They didn't have a statue for Egro the Unbreakable? An insult like that could not fly, so he obviously had to destroy the other statues for the other monsters, which brought the Thunderbolts to fight him. Instead, after Egro punched Power Man through the roof with his big lava hands and incapacitated persuasion with his telepathic abilities, which helped him learn English, he surrendered to America Chavez and explained the situation. Then he was invited to join the team. Yay! Happy ending for the little steroid Yoda. Number one, Nightmare. Might. Just like Superman has Mr. Mixy as Pitalik and Batman has Batmite, Dick Grayson, the superhero known as Nightwing, now has his own imp superfan from the fifth dimension. Dixel, though Dixel prefers to be known as Nightmite. Well, it might seem strange to put an M from the fifth dimension on a superhero list given, you know, some of their track records. Nightmite is genuinely well meaning and helpful, unlike most other imps who are somewhat mischievous or just downright troublesome. Being an imp from the fifth dimension also means that Dixel can be super powerful, as he has magical, reality bending, and warping powers. Nightmite made his first appearance very recently in the comics, as of the time of this recording, in issue number 98 of Nightwing, which was released in November of 2022. And coming in at number 10, Vanish. Image Comics seems to be going back to its gritty, magical roots with Vanish. Vanish follows Oliver Harrison. This chosen one peaked at the age of 14 when he took down the leader of the biggest threat to his universe in a mystical place called the Everkeep. Now, as an adult, this chosen one indulges in every vice he can, living a mediocre, pretty sloppy life. Until a group of heroes show up called the Prestige, who are actually the followers of the threat that Oliver took down when he was 14. Now, using his magical abilities, Oliver takes it on himself to play the part of a hero in the disguise of a villain to bring down the heroic prestige. The comic builds up this super cool magic but violent world. It's incredibly gritty but filled with dark fantasy and magic and it's just so cool. Number 9, Rogue Son. Dylan Siegel has been living life with his mom when he's suddenly called to a reading of his estranged father's will. Now, during that reading, he discovers his dear old dad was a superhero called Rogue Son, and now Dylan has been granted the superhero mantle for himself. Now, this super angsty teen is in charge of protecting our world from the forces of the supernatural while also trying to figure out who exactly took down his dad. The art in this story is awesome, and Rogue Son's suit is incredibly cool. With really cool fire based abilities and a whole lot of family drama, Rogue Son from Image Comics is a fun story you should definitely check out. Number 8, Dr. Multiverse. All right, breaking away from Image Comics now and landing firmly in DC's territory, we have Maya Chamara, Dr. Multiverse. Dr. Multiverse is alone in the multiverse, meaning there is only one of her. Originating from Earth 8, Maya was bathed in cosmic energies and was granted the powers of the multiverse, which basically means that she's able to see variants and alternate versions of people living in different realities. She can see people and objects passing between dimensions, and she has the ability to locate and track anything she has come into contact with throughout the multiverse. She also has access to vast energy manipulation abilities, which let her fire blasts and create shields, but she can totally open up portals to other universes and send people back to their own universe. This former member of the Retaliators became part of the Justice League Incarnate using her multiversal powers to help this multiversal team of heroes. She's like a DC version of Marvel's Captain Universe, Starbrand, and America Chavez all just mixed into one, but I think she's pretty alright. Number 7, Batwalker. I'm gonna be honest, I just assumed this had already been done in the past, but no. Dinosaur versions of DC's superheroes had not been done before. I'm alright with this because that means this year we were treated to the Jurassic League, a DC story that takes place on an Earth where heroes like Batman, Wonder Woman, and Superman are actually dinosaurs that protect the puny human race from the carnivore dinosaurs who would eat them. There's a Brachiosaurus Supersaur from another world who looks eerily like Superman, a Triceratops Wonder Dawn hailing from the Isle of Trimascara, and on the outskirts of Growltham City, we are introduced to Bat Walker, an Allosaurus who dresses up like a bat after the loss of his parents at the hands of an insane Dilophosaurus who goes by the name Joker. I mean, there's even a panel of this comically green Allosaurus throwing a stone batarang, and it's just something that I never knew I needed in my life until this point. I'm just so glad it exists. Number six, the spirit of variance, Vox Igni. Sean Cassidy is not a new character by any stretch of the imagination, but in Legion of X number seven.
2011 by Marvel, he does become something completely new. Sean was betrayed by Mora McTaggart who stole his face so she could enter into Krakoa. So when he was brought back to life, he was rather upset. Now there's a whole thing going on as well with the character of Legion right now that I just can't get into, but essentially a character named Mother Righteous offers Legion a gift in the form of a certain kind of power. David Holler refuses this gift, but luckily for us, Sean Cassidy was there to take it instead. Making a deal with Mother Righteous, Cassidy was given, or I guess, possessed by a cast out spirit of vengeance called the Spirit of Variance. This transformed Banshee into a flaming skull version of himself named Vox Igni, which is the voice of fire. And if a name like that doesn't sound cool to you, then just look at this character. Good golly, he's awesome. Number five, Bat Prince. Another alternate version of Batman, I know, but he belongs to probably one of my favorite alternate reality stories to come out of DC Comics, Dark Knights of Steel. This story takes place in a world of medieval fantasy where the Wayne family ruled their kingdom until the mother and father of Superman came to Earth. The L family house became ruler of the land after a horrible attack on the Wayne family. Now, as the surviving son of the Waynes, Bruce serves as both a knight and son to the L family, with his network of Robins and his brilliant mind. But as the world is at each other's throats in this story, this bat prince learns about the actions that led to his birth and the powers he now possesses as a half Kryptonian Dark Knight. Dark Knights of Steel that came out this year in 2022 just has so many interesting and fresh takes on classic DC characters. It's fresh and fun and I got a variant cover of the first issue and it looks so sweet. Maybe, maybe one day I'll let you guys see it, maybe. But definitely read this story. Definitely do it. Number four, Miracle Man. Miracle Man is also not a new character. In fact, Marvel's Miracle Man is one of comics' most dramatic publishing debacles, coming back from 1954. Decades of rights battles over the character meant that he kind of bounced around publishers and then disappeared from the pages of comics altogether for a long, long time. Which is why it seemed way too good to be true when Marvel announced in 2013 that it had acquired the rights to Miracle Man. Now, over the years, the company has attempted to bring the character back, but even more legal issues kind of stopped that from being able to happen. But luckily, starting in October 2022, Neil Gaiman finally continued the Silver Age arc that he had created for the character with Marvel planning a number of other Miracle Man books. So now, after all this time, we get both one of the newest and kind of one of the oldest characters all wrapped up into one awesome Miracle Man, Marvel Man, Mickey Moran, whatever you want to call him, shaped package. Number three, Abyss. All right, before you jump on me in the comments, this isn't the villain Abyss. That guy was Lex Luthor's own evil Batman who was honestly kind of cool, but he did not last very long. Abyss was defeated by Batman who got some massive help from a Bodnesian police officer named Detective Kea, who helped Batman not only survived, but even forced Abyss to retreat after he had defeated most of Batman Incorporated, which led him straight into a defeat at the hands of the Dark Knight himself. Now, after Abyss had been defeated, Kaya found some of the villain's equipment and decided to hunt down the ones who had ended her parents' lives. There's a lot of parallels between Batman and the characters in and around him in the later issues of Batman Volume 3 that came out this year in 2022. Anyways, Batman offered to help Kaya, but in helping her, he also talked her into just arresting the criminals instead of doing what she was planning to do, which I'm sure you can imagine what that was. She wasn't brought into Batman Inc., but she is now another ally of Batman. And I hope she gets some more appearances in the comics from this point on because it the costume's pretty cool. Number two, the Joneses. How about a whole family of superheroes for this spot? And not just that, but also some social and political commentary wrapped up into it. That sounds like so much fun. Not really. Anyways, out of AWA Studios comes The Joneses, which is a spin-off of another AWA Studios comic called The Resistance, and it focuses on a suburban family who have gained superpowers after a global pandemic known as the Great Death. All four family members, mother, father, sister, and brother, were all transformed into something superhuman 
But unfortunately, the world has begun to embrace fascism, born of fear of the pandemic and the superpowered individuals that have appeared known as the Reborns. The Joneses face some pretty scary consequences if they are exposed as Reborns, and so they are presented with the dilemma of using their abilities for good at the risk of exposing themselves and inviting danger, or just laying low and staying out of the way. It's an interesting little idea for a comic book, and the global pandemic idea seems a little bit familiar. I don't know why. So I found it fun to just jump into this little 2022 comic from AWA Studios, and maybe you will too. Number one, Guts and Glory. If you're part of the Thunderbolts, are you really a hero? Yes, yes you are. The problem for me and this list is that when Guts and Glory first appeared in Thunderbolts Volume 4, Number 1 from August 2022, we weren't really given much information on the guy and we still haven't been really, which makes my job way harder. He was placed on Hawkeye's Thunderbolts team under the mayor of New York, Luke Cage. The only reason given for this character's introduction to the team was that apparently having a quote, man of mystery would do wonders for the team's public relations. That's actually the reason. There's literally nothing else given about why he's here. He is a big stocky guy with cyborg body parts and an absolutely insane amount of weaponry, including a particle rupture laser, which I don't even want to imagine what that thing does to a person. It just sounds horrible. He also looks a bit like Cable, as he's a totally 90s cyber inspired warrior, but just more military and not nearly as old as Cable, with absolutely no information about his backstory, again, or his training. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marvel. Please change this. Gutsin is cool. Okay. Thank you. Number 10, Alpha Flight. This is for sure the least obscure entry on the list as I choose to talk about them constantly and Alpha Flight has been somewhat reinvented in the last few years and changed into an international space force being led by Captain Marvel, but we are talking about the original team. First appearing in X-Men number 120, Alpha Flight was Canada's answer to the Avengers with members with unique abilities from all over Canada. Unlike most super teams who are always working together, Alpha Flight operated in more of a Mission Impossible, James Bond kind of style, by choosing heroes from their roster and assigning each of them to specific missions that they would handle as individuals and pairs, only coming together as a full team in the case of extreme threats. Despite multiple tries by Marvel to give the team their own ongoing series, Alpha Flight has never quite caught on in the States. Perhaps they are just too specifically Canadian for a readership who tends to prefer American-centric stories, or maybe they just haven't been given the right push into the mainstream. Either way, Alpha Flight remains a team that not a huge amount of readers have heard of and even fewer have actually read. Although, they did appear in one episode of the classic X-Men cartoon, Small Victories. Number 9, Force Works. When it was determined that the Avengers' ever-expanding roster should be better divided up across the United States rather than everyone working out of New York, the West Coast Avengers were formed. This experiment didn't end up working out and the team was soon disbanded. In a typically Tony Stark move, Tony Stark decided that he should instead fund and create his own superhero team to help protect the West Coast. The resulting team was Forceworks. The original team consisted of Iron Man, Spider Woman, Wonder Man, and US Agent, with Scarlet Witch being chosen as the team leader. The team operated for a while, taking on threats like the Mandarin and Kang the Conqueror, but the team was plagued with internal issues. Despite Scarlet Witch being the team leader, Iron Man was constantly undermining her authority and forcing the team to carry out his personal vendettas. This attitude culminated in him forcing the team to brutally kidnap Hawkeye, which got him booted from the team. Forceworks carried on without him for a while, but eventually decided to disband, although they were briefly brought back under the leadership of Maria Hill in order to fight the robot revolution. Forceworks is an obscure offshoot of the already relatively obscure West Coast Avengers, however they did serve as the supporting cast for Iron Man's 90s animated series. Number 8, The Outlaws. Not to be confused with the team from DC Comics, Marvel's Outlaws are a group of heroes, all with a criminal past, who are led by Spider-Man and Silver Sable. The group formed when photo graphic evidence came out implicating Spider-Man in a robbery. Wanting to prove the innocence of the man who had helped them reform, Prowler, Rocket Racer, Willa the Wisp, Paladin, and Sandman all began searching for evidence that would prove the webbed wall crawler's innocence. They discovered that Spidey was actually working for Silver Sable and that what he had stolen was actually incriminating evidence against a member of the Magia crime family. Impressed with the group's skills, Silver Sable brought them on as freelancers and the team would occasionally come together, usually whenever Spider-Man was being framed or something and needed support 
support from outside of the Avengers. Although some of the various members of the team are relatively well known characters, their team isn't well known as they come together so rarely and haven't teamed up since 1991. Number 7. Cyforce When a telepathic CIA agent named Emmett Proudhawk had a vision about five young people with psychic abilities being protected by a hawk, he decided to track down the people in his vision and bring them together to become Cyforce. He got most of them together but was killed by a Russian operative. The five psychic youths discovered that when they all touched Proudhawk's mystic medallion, it summoned a creature called the Cyhawk who would help them defeat their enemies. You know, like Captain Planet. The youths worked together to defeat an evil Russian paranormal named Rodstov, and they were chased by members of the CIA, the KGB, and a shadowy organization called the Medusa Web, who eventually brought the kids on as freelance agents. Although they had their own 32 issue series, the fact that this Marvel team has no recognizable superheroes and is based in Earth 148,611 rather than the mainstream Earth 616 universe keeps them pretty obscure. Number six, Force of July. The first DC entry on this list, Force of July were an Americana themed group who often found themselves at odds with the outsiders. The Force answered to the American Security Agency and were tasked with eliminating anyone whose activities were deemed to be subversive to America's interests by any means necessary. Some of the team's members include Lady Liberty, Silent Majority, Sparkler, Mayflower, and their leader, Major Victory. Although they aren't technically villains, their fanatic patriotism prevented them from seeing that they were being manipulated manipulated by their handler who was using them to help his scheme to create a satellite called Project Orwell that would have been used to spy on people using their televisions. This plot was stopped by the outsiders and the Force of July later found themselves fighting against the Suicide Squad who killed Sparkler in Mayflower. The remaining members ended up joining the squad but did not last long on the team's roster. Number 5. The Inferior Five Coming from Earth 12 in the DC multiverse, this team are the Nepo Babies of a team of heroes called the Freedom Brigade. When the Freedom Brigade retired, the heroes encouraged their their children to follow in their footsteps and they started a team dedicated to protecting the people of Megaopolis. Known as the Fearsome Five, the members of this team, Awkward Man, Blimp, Dumb Bunny, and White Feather, have somewhat useless and conflicting powers and although they usually manage to save the day, it is usually a result of dumb luck rather than skill. Their lameness led to the people of Megalopolis calling their champions the Inferior Five, which the team eventually decided to adopt as their official name. In Crisis on Infinite Earths, their world was destroyed and as a result they were sent to comic book Limbo, which is a realm similar to the Island of Misfit Toys, where characters who are written out of continuity remain until they're brought back into continuity. Number 4. The League of Losers In the Marvel Universe of Earth 6215, a time-traveling villain from the future named Kronok used his knowledge of the past to travel back in time to the present with an army and kill all of Earth's mightiest heroes. Fortunately, the records he was working off of did not include any reference to these C-list Marvel characters because none of them had ever done anything that was worthy of note. Darkhawk, Speedball, Dagger, Terror, X-23, Gravity, and Sleepwalker were thus able to take on Kronok and travel back to before the villain had stolen his time travel tech and stop him. Although this stranded the team in the future, it also created a divergent timeline known as Earth 2992, where the villain's scheme was never an issue. Wow, time travel can be such a pain to explain. Number 3. Section 8 One of the strangest teams in the DC Universe, Section 8 is a group of what I will very generously call heroes who operate out of Gotham City. Each member of the team is more bizarre than the last, so buckle up. Shakes is a schizophrenic with a speech impediment. Jean de Baton Baton is a stereotypical French man who hits people with a baton. Defenestrator is a massive former Arkham inmate who carries around a window to smash over his enemies' heads. Flem Gem spits massive amounts of snot at his enemies in order to blind them. Bueno Excelente is just some guy who sneaks up on his enemies and then essays them. Dog Welder is a crazy person who welds dogs to people's faces and Friendly Fire is a hero who can shoot energy beams but is incapable of hitting anything he aims at, usually hitting his teammates instead. They are led by Six Pack, an alcoholic who pees himself and then attacks people with a beer bottle. Shockingly, this team has not gotten a big budget movie and all of them were killed after an encounter with the mini angled ones with the exception of Six Pack who suddenly manifested reality warping powers to defeat the villains and save the world. Number 2. The Neo Knights After having great success publishing comic books based on Hasbro's line of G.I. Joe toys, the two companies collaborated again to create the series that would give much needed backstory for Hasbro's new line of toys, the Transformers. A lot of the Transformers mythology came from these comics, but due to the rights of certain characters remaining with the comic book company, not all of the elements were brought over for the television series or subsequent films. One of these elements is the superhero team, the Neo Knights. When the Autobots return to space, leaving no one to protect their longtime ally, GB Blackrock, he decided to bring together 
a team of superpowered humans in order to fight any Decepticons that caused trouble on Earth. The members are Circuit Breaker, a woman who was paralyzed in an encounter with the Transformers and has developed a special suit that allows her to walk as well as fly and shoot repulsor beams. Also on the team are Thunder Punch, a man who can enlarge his feet and hands and punch with heightened strength, Rapture, a woman who can cause any sentient being to shut down and enter an elaborate fantasy, and Dynamo, who could channel the planet's latent energies. They are extremely obscure, only showing up in the original US and UK Transformers comics, and due to Hasbro having the rights for most of the Transformers and Marvel owning the rights to this team, they are likely to remain so for quite some time. Number 1. The Forgotten Heroes They may have more appearances than some of the other teams on this list, and some of their members are relatively well known, but with a name like The Forgotten Heroes, how could they not end up on the top spot for this list? The team consists of a bunch of DC heroes who all stumbled upon ancient golden pyramids. When the heroes tried to report what they had found, the US government disavowed them and ruined each of their reputations to discredit them. Immortal Man brought all the heroes together and filled them in that the pyramids were part of a scheme by Vandal Savage to kill Superman. They formed a team together and teamed up with the Man of Steel to stop Vandal's plot. The team lives up to its name with members like Atomic Knight, Ballistic Congo Bill, Cave Carson, Dolphin, The Ray, Vigilante and Resurrection Man, as well as a few slightly more well-known heroes such as Rip Hunter, Animal Man, and Rick Flag. Number 10, Uncle Marvel. For those who are new to the DC Captain Marvel world and whose introduction to the character may have been with the first film Shazam, you might not know about the extended members of the Shazam or Marvel family. But don't worry, we're here to make sure no one ever forgets. Uncle Marvel you'd assume was Billy Batson's uncle. But no, he actually claimed to be Mary Batson's uncle after discovering her superhero identity as Mary Marvel. But he really wasn't her uncle at all. Dudley H. Dudley was a civilian name and he was originally the janitor at their school. Still, despite the fact that the Marvel team knew that Dudley was a fraud, or a dud if you will, who made up the story of being Mary's uncle simply so he could join them, they decided he was mostly harmless and enjoyed his company enough to accept him as Uncle Marvel, a portly older man with no powers who attributed his frequent power loss to his ever flaring Shazambago. Ouch, my Shazambago. Number 9, Sparky. Once a sidekick to one of DC's most underrated heroes, the original Blue Beetle, comes Sparkington J. Northrup, an American orphan who was adopted by Lord Wellington Northrup of Suppleshire, England. All was well and good with his life up until World War II when Sparky was sent back to the US by his dad for safety, where he ended up becoming the sidekick of the hero Blue Beetle instead. Although he doesn't look like much, Sparky is actually a pretty decent fighter and was a huge asset during his time as Blue Beetle's sidekick. Described by Blue Beetle himself as a fighting, leaping little athlete on whom he can depend on for assistance at all times, it was really strange that he just kind of up and vanished from the series in 1942. However, he did show up again a year later to help the Beatle on the Western Front. Once the war was finally over though, Sparky was able to return to his home in England and retire from the hero business forever. Number 8, Alpha. This Spider-Man sidekick happened to go to the same school as Peter Parker and had a similar accident which granted him superpowers. However, he was known for being an underachiever with a C grade average, and it was his laziness and lack of responsibility when it came to wielding his powers that prompted Spider-Man to remove Alpha's powers. Alpha originally became Spider-Man's sidekick after Spider-Man helped free him and his parents from Jackal, who had kind of hoped to take Alpha's powers for himself. It was after this encounter that Spider-Man both made him a sidekick and then kind of realized how irresponsible he was and decided to drain his powers using the villain Terminus's power siphoning staff. Slowly Spider-Man would restore Alpha's powers over time. Alpha's civilian name is Andrew McGuire, no relation to Tobey Maguire, but his name does seem to be in honor of both Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire who had both played Spider-Man on the big screen previous to when his character was created. Number 7. Nix. Leaving Marvel and DC for a bit of a change, we're going to be taking a look at Image Comics' Carrie Andrews, the on-again, off-again sidekick and love interest of the anti-hero Spawn. Becoming a spellcaster by the age of four, Carrie was originally just a witch who was interested in Spawn, who named herself Nix after the powerful Greek goddess. With a vast array of magical abilities including retrocognition, sound manipulation, and a psychic link, Carrie has been a huge help to Al Simmons' Spawn whenever she is by his side. She even at times donned the Spawn costume herself, which gave her all the powers of the Hell Spawn alongside her magical abilities. During her time as Al Simmons' sidekick, she journeyed through the pits of hell, was possessed by a demon, and was even depowered by mystical forces. But in the end, she did get them back and decided to leave Spawn altogether, succumbing to the guilt she felt from the time that she betrayed the man she loved. Man, if that ain't true love, I don't know what it is. 
Number 6 Bob Bob used to work as a Hydra agent and was basically forced into becoming Deadpool's sidekick when Deadpool infiltrated a Hydra base and ran into the poor goon. He has popped up here and thereafter in the Deadpool comics, often appearing as Deadpool's reluctant or sometimes over enthused sidekick. Often hoping that Deadpool will treat him better this time around, only to be disappointed. At one point, Deadpool bought himself a pirate ship and had Bob join him once more as his sidekick, which meant not that Bob got to dress up as a badass pirate, but instead was forced to wear a parrot costume. Costume and finish every sentence with a squat? During his time serving Deadpool on the ship, he almost died of dehydration due to how stuffy and how hot it was inside that costume under the blazing Caribbean sun. Poor Bob. Number 5, Doivy Dickles. Now, if you're not familiar with the first Green Lantern, Alan Scott, then you probably don't know who Charles Doivy Dickles is. But hey, that's okay. That's what I'm here for. Back in the Golden Age of Comics, Alan Scott had Doivy join him on his adventures for pretty close to eight years after Doivy saved him from a group of gangsters. Although he didn't possess any powers, Doivy is surprisingly badass, as not only was he a skilled fighter, he was an excellent driver and pilot. In his beloved taxi that he named Goytrude, he has driven Green Lantern around at lightning fast speeds, which honestly seems a little bit silly considering that Alan Scott could fly, but I don't know, maybe he got tired sometimes. Dickles has made several cameo appearances since his original run ended, mostly as a comedic relief character in the early 2000s. His most famous modern appearance was when he joined a group of other forgotten Golden Age sidekicks in order to form the hilariously inept group Old Justice. Now I personally would love to see more of him in the future, so DC, get on that. Number 4, Terra. But not that Terra. This Terra is also known as Atlee and is from an underground world known as Strata. Her and her people take it upon themselves to protect the Earth and its ecosystem. Atlee herself was granted geokinetic powers, which she uses to do this. Atlee's powers are a genetic duplicate of the original Terra, who is often known for her ties to the Teen Titans, Tara Markov. Atlee herself has teamed up with both Supergirl and Power Girl and has even allied herself with Harley Quinn, thinking she was doing good by helping Harley to steal from the Joker's. Vault, which she sort of was. Number three, Zook. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I find it really hard to believe that the stoic and pretty much emotionless Martian Manhunter had this little guy as a sidekick. Hailing from an alternate dimension, Zook is a member of the alien race known as, well, Zooks, and came to Earth alongside a few other evil aliens after a portal was opened. Zook met up with Martian Manhunter while he was trying to apprehend the two evil aliens and instantly took a liking to the hero. And I think the feeling was a bit mutual because when Zook was left stranded on Earth when the dimensional rift back to his home was closed prematurely, John Jones took him under his wing. Zook has a number of abilities thanks to his alien physiology. He can change his body temperature to be extremely hot or extremely cold, he can see through disguises no matter how complex, and can flatten or expand his body as a defense mechanism or to make him fit into tight spaces. Sadly though, he disappeared from the DC continuity after the events of Infinite Crisis. Number 2, Spider Bite. Spider Bite is Spider Man's biggest fan and pint sized sidekick, who has only appeared in one comic, Friendly Neighborhood Spider Man issue number 6 from 2019. He helps Spider Man take on the Sinister 60, though this is later revealed to be a make pretend adventure for Spider Bite's benefit. In reality, Spider Bite is Nathan, a young boy who is fighting cancer and whose one wish was to become Spider Man's sidekick, which is why Spidey came to join him for this adventure filled day. At the end of Spidey's visit, Nathan doesn't want Spidey to leave, as he's afraid if he goes to sleep, he may never wake up. Spider-Man agrees to extend his visit and takes Nathan out with him for a bit to swing around New York. Aww. Number 1, Zack. Just Zack. Created solely for the 1980s Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles cartoon comes Zack, a little boy who appeared for the first time in Season 3, Episode 26, entitled The Fifth Turtle. As the biggest self-proclaimed TMNT fan, Zack was so crazy about the turtles that he took up arms with a hockey stick tossed on a green bandana and attempted to help them in their fight against crime. Now obviously the turtles wanted absolutely nothing to do with the young crime fighter at first because, well they didn't want him to get hurt, but when Zack was able to secretly follow them back to their lairs, they decided that he had what it took to be a part of the team, making him the fifth turtle. Although he's just a pretty average kid, Zack had a knack for solving mysteries and tracking down the bad guys, and across four seasons, he helped the turtles go up against villains like the Rat King, Shredder, and even more. Although. He wasn't the best under interrogation though, since he was the only one not able to withstand the tickling interrogation, which, you know, I kinda understand because I'm pretty ticklish too. Number 10, Sportsmaster. Starting off with a pretty vanilla villain, Lawrence Crusher Croc was a very competitive sportsman who excelled at many sports, but 
he never played fair. Doing anything possible to win, he was eventually banned from playing any sport at a professional level, which for some reason led him to a life of crime. I don't know why. After a run-in with the Green Lantern, he supposedly dies, but it's revealed that he actually just faked his death, and that's when he became the Sportsmaster. After a little success as a solo villain, Croc decided to join the Injustice Society, but after a series of crimes, he ends up in jail for a while. After serving his time, he teamed up with the Huntress and actually ended up marrying her, has a daughter, and then the three of them committed crimes together as one big happy crime family. Croc does eventually lose his life at the hands of the Human Flame following the events of Cry Final Crisis though. With basically no superpowers other than being pretty good at sports, it's no wonder this film has been forgotten in time. Check him out in his first appearance, All American Comics number 85. Number 9, The Eraser. Probably the villain with the most interesting attire on this list today, Leonard Fiasco actually went to high school alongside Bruce Wayne. Due to his low grades, he actually ended up dropping out of school and turned to a life of crime as the villain Eraser. He apparently chose that name as a reminder of his constant failures during his school life and also because he wanted to provide a special service to the criminals of Gotham City. Donning an Eraser helmet that looks exactly like the top of a pencil and alongside his signature yellow suit, he has been seen throughout the years erasing every trace of evidence left at any crime scene making it impossible for the police to find any clues. And he does such a good job of it that he manages to stump Batman and Robin from time to time. He is eventually caught by the dynamic duo though after they infiltrate his hideout and not much has been seen of him since. If you're interested in his story, check him out in his first appearance in 1966, Batman number 188. Number eight, Condiment King. Now with a name like Mitchell Mayo, it makes sense that this villain's name would be the Condiment King. Once an inmate of Arkham Asylum, Mayo somehow managed to break out but was immediately subdued by Batman and Catwoman. His dream was to one day open a restaurant on Coney Island and he actually does achieve that, stating he's turned legit and wants nothing more than to leave his life of crime behind. However, he does later don his suit once more and does his best to wreak havoc against Batman and Nightwing. Possessing no powers whatsoever, Mayo relies heavily on his gadgets the most prominent being his condiment guns. These guns shoot a variety of sauces including ketchup, barbecue sauce, mustard, and more. However, it's kind of useless because it doesn't shoot anything at a high enough pressure to be lethal. The best it can do is create a nasty stain and just ruin your day. Check out this villain for yourself in his first appearance in Birds of Prey Volume 1 number 37 or in his new 52 reintroduction in 2016's Batman Volume 3 number 9. Number 7 we have Johnny Karaoke. The crooning Yakuza Lone Shark is the next on our list today. Definitely not the most fearsome of Batman foes, however, this villain is way too interesting to stay buried for too long. After all, you've got to respect any American fearsome enough to rise through the ranks of the Yakuza. Although he seems like a very happy-go-lucky kind of guy, this is all an act because once you let your guard down around him, he'll whip out his cane that doubles as a microphone and a sword and do whatever he feels is necessary to protect himself and his geisha girls. Though he hasn't really made any appearances outside of his first appearance in 2007's Batman number 660, the character Jonathan John Charisma Brown from Batman Arkham Knight is heavily influenced by him and likely an homage to the smooth talking Elvis impersonator. Like many lesser known Batman villains, Johnny does not possess any powers other than the ability to sing pretty well, but his connection to the Yakuza combined with his own skills makes him a fairly dangerous foe. Number 6, Flamingo. Edward Flamingo, known professionally as the Assassin Flamingo, is truly ruthless and I'm genuinely surprised he hasn't appeared in the media more. As an emotionless, unfeeling killer with the odd tendency to eat his victims' faces after he's killed them, Flamingo has proven to be a formidable foe as he is able to temporarily paralyze Damian Wayne and would have killed him if it lasted longer, showing that he has no problem killing anyone whatsoever. He even nearly killed the Red Hood and would have gotten away with it if it weren't for the intervention of Dick Grayson, who had recently taken up the mantle of Batman after Bruce Wayne's death. As a master assassin, Flamingo has the know-how to use pretty much every firearm imaginable, and thanks to his iconic pink motorcycle, he is rarely caught. Described as an evil Zorro by his creator Grant Morrison, why not check him out for yourself in 2007's Batman number 666. Number 5, Maxi Zeus. Chronologically the fourth Batman villain to be committed to Arkham Asylum behind the Joker, Two-Face, and Rupert Thorne, Maximilian started out with pretty humble beginnings as a Greek history teacher. After his wife dies from unrevealed circumstances, Zeus loses his sanity and becomes a crime lord, using his intelligence and resources to rise to power in Gotham's underworld. Upon his very first murder though, he is thwarted by Batman and committed to Arkham Asylum, where he escaped from many times, one of which Batman actually let side as it was so he could go wish his daughter happy birthday. With each escape leading him to lose more and more of his sanity, Zeus eventually gets to a point where he joins forces with the Children of Ares, Deimos, Phobos, and Eris, to help merge Gotham City with Ares' throne capital, the Aeropagus. 
Maxi is actually killed as a result of this whole plot, and his sacrifice is what brings the return of Ares, who is thankfully stopped by Wonder Woman. Funnily enough, it's actually revealed about a year later that Maxi is alive and well and running an illegal casino that eventually gets shut down thanks to a tip from the boy Wonder, and Maxi is sent back to jail without any struggle. You've probably guessed it, but this guy doesn't have any powers either. Basically, his knowledge as a history teacher and his ability to lead got him as far as possible, which is pretty impressive if you ask me. Check him out in his first appearance in 1979's Detective Comics number 483. Number 4, Dollhouse. As the daughter of Barton Mathis, known best as the Dollmaker, Matilda Mathis commits crimes and operates under the name Dollhouse. From a young age, she was taught how to hunt and slaughter people and usually wore a doll face that was grafted over her own when committing these crimes. Forced to go into hiding after her father's business starts to go wrong after he kidnaps Batman, she is the only one of his children to actually end up resurfacing and to carry on the family business later on. Dollhouse picks up right where her father left off, taking Gotham's more misfortunate citizens and making money off of their organs through the black market. Like Dollmaker, Matilda turns the bodies into dolls, of which she actually keeps more than a few for her own dollhouse. Making her first appearance in 2011's Detective Comics Volume 2, Number 2, check out her twisted upbringing for yourself and let me know in the comments below what you think. Number 3, The Ventriloquist. Since his debut in Detective Comics number 583, three versions of The Ventriloquist have perplexed audiences. These versions being Arnold Wesker, Peyton Riley, and New 52's Shauna Belzer. But let's focus on Wesker as he is the best known of the three. Because of his multiple personality disorder, Wesker uses a ventriloquist dummy to commit mob-related crimes. This doll, famously named Scarface for his Al Capone-like appearance, controls Wesker and the crime business they run. If Scarface isn't present, then Wesker projects an identity onto another inanimate object, usually sock puppets or anything else that he can use as a puppet. First appearing in 1988's Detective Comics number 583, we've seen Wesker as a member of the Secret Society of Supervillains, the Black Lantern Corps, and even the Justice League of Arkham, with all the stories and battles leading up to his tragic death in 2006's Detective Comics number 818. A year after surviving Luther's attempt to recreate the multiverse, we see the Great White Shark burst into Wesker's apartment and kill him with a single shot to the head. Man, it's such a sad way to go for such a good villain. Number 2, Professor Pig. Lazlo Valentine, aka Professor Pig, and that's P-Y-G, not P-I-G, was a former agent of Spiral driven mad by his own mind-eroding drugs, and he was an enemy of Dick Grayson and Damian Wayne during their time as Batman and Robin. Characterized as a schizophrenic, Pig's mental illness explains many of his habits, one of the most prominent being his, his desire to make everything perfect. Now, how does he go about accomplishing this task? Well, by unleashing Dolatrons and mind-altering substances onto Gotham City. The Dolatrons are at the center of Professor Pig's story depravity, being brainwashed people who followed his every command as though they were robots. And though they act as his loyal minions, the Dolatrons are actually very much expendable and have been replaced many, many times. Despite his mental illness, Valentine is still a formidable foe with a mastery of basic hand-to-hand -hand combat and a high-level proficiency with a knife, since they were once an incredible surgeon able to perform complicated surgeries, once actually switching a hand with a foot. Making their first appearance alongside Flamingo in 2007's Batman number 666, check out their origin story for yourself, or read their new 52 introduction in Batman Volume 2 number 1. And finally, number 1, The Phantasm. Created for the DC animated movie Batman Mask of the Phantasm, Andrea Beaumont treads that line between good and evil as the vigilante, the Phantasm. Her and Bruce were university sweethearts and actually had plans to get married one day. However, her father was a rich businessman who got involved with the wrong kind of people and ended up having to go into hiding and eventually all that got him killed. This drove Andrea to take revenge on all those who were a member of the criminal gang who killed her father, especially Jack Napier who ended up becoming the clown prince of crime. To take her revenge on Chucky Soul, Buzz Bronski, and Sal Valestra, she dons the mantle of the Phantasm, a figure that kind of resembles the Grim Reaper, complete with a scythe that she wears over her right hand. Using her father's money to hone her skills, she returns to Gotham years later to complete her goal of killing all the mob bosses. However, she does not get the chance to kill the Joker as Batman ends up intervening. Years later, she does kind of redeem herself by not killing Terry McGinnis' parents after being hired to, but after causing so much bloodshed, I really think she's more on the evil side of things. If you want to see her story for yourself, check out Batman Mask of the Phantasm and let me know what you think. Number 10, The Flower Cartel. This one might be lesser known as they are relatively new. Not just an enemy to Wolverine either, but an enemy to likely all of mutant kind and the mutant nation of Krakoa. The Flower Cartel are a group responsible for smuggling the Krakoan miracle flowers, which mutants use to create medicinal drugs for the world in exchange for the global acknowledgement, rights, and respect of their mutant nation. 
it. They don't just steal these flowers, but have been using them to create recreational, potent, hallucinogenic drugs. The drugs they've created are so powerful that they often cause the death of users and may even be affiliated with mind control or possession of those exposed to the drug. We're not really sure yet. In Wolverine's newest series, he teams up with CIA agent Jeff Bannister to try and find out who exactly is behind the flower cartel's criminal activities. Number 9, Hobgoblin. I think we all know Hobgoblin fairly well. If you're a Spider-Man fan, that is. But did you know that he also tussled with Wolverine and the X-Men? This altercation went down in the Spider-Man animated series from the 90s, where actually Mark Hamill himself voiced Hobgoblin. We see Wolverine, the X-Men, and Spider-Man forced to deal with Hobgoblin in the season 2 episode titled Mutants Revenge, which is a crossover episode with the 90s X-Men animated series. Yay, I love crossovers. After Beast is kidnapped, the X-Men go out looking for him, which leads them to team up with Spider-Man, who is also looking for Hank. But Wolverine doesn't like Spider-Man, and while these two fight one another, Hobgoblin also sees this as a unique opportunity to attack all of the above parties, causing grief for Wolverine while he attempts to rescue Beast from Dr. Herbert Landon, who also is another random, lesser known enemy of Wolverine's in that episode anyways. Number 8, The Savage Land Mutates. When it comes to other mutant and even mutate groups outside of the X-Men, people are not always as knowledgeable. If you are just discovering mutant kind now, you may not know many other mutant groups outside of the X-Men and there's sometimes a villainous counterpart, often led by Magneto, the Brotherhood of Mutants or the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. But there are actually a lot more groups than just these two. There are the more Locks, who often live in the sewers, and there are the Savage Land Mutates, who generally work with Sauron and are, you guessed it, from the Savage Lands. Mutates are like mutants, but the difference is generally that they weren't born with natural abilities, which later activated or natural mutations. But instead, they evolved to become mutated, gaining powers or a physical mutation. The Savage Land mutates are occasionally enemies of the X-Men and by extension Wolverine, who is a member of the heroic mutant team. They even pop up in the 1988 run of Wolverine in issue 69, where Wolverine knocks a lot of them down in order to get to Sauron. Number 7, The Collector. While some may now be more familiar with the character of The Collector himself, thanks to the Guardians of the Galaxy Marvel Cinematic Universe films, fans may not know that he and Wolverine actually had some pretty big beef. What happened between these two? Well, Wolverine basically freed thousands of people from a planet where the Collector had them imprisoned. You see, these people were the survivors of planets the Galactus had destroyed, whom the Collector had, well, collected. But you know, to these people, they are being held against their will, as prisoners on a shielded planet. A character named Arya, who kind of looks like a space elf, reaches out to Wolverine, seeking his help to free these people, and he answers her plea, getting into a direct conflict with the Collector later on in this story arc known as The Great Escape, part of the 1988 Wolverine series. Basically, if you want lots of random stories, you need to read the 1988 Wolverine series. Number 6, The Iron Monk. The Iron Monk appears to be a villain sent after Wolverine by the hand while Logan is being held in prison in issue 108 of the Wolverine series that started in 1988. He proves to be a formidable foe and gives Wolverine a pretty good fight for a few pages. I will say I did enjoy it. The Iron Monk you see cannot be defeated by any mortal weapon nor any mortal hand. In the end, Wolverine ends up using the Honor Sword bestowed to him by the Silver Samurai. The Honor Sword was forged out of a meteorite by a demon and seems to do the trick, causing the Iron Monk to be reduced to a wisp of pink smoke and a robe. Number 5, Citadel. Despite the fact that Wolverine did later try to help Citadel and likely never truly saw him as an enemy, Citadel resented both Wolverine and Alpha Flight after they stopped him from achieving his goal. Citadel was one of the antagonists in issue 5 of Wolverine First Class, where Citadel was also known then as Weapon Y. Wolverine suspected he was also made by the same people who had put adamantium inside of him, as Citadel had adamantium skin or an adamantium exoskeleton externally. instead of internally. Citadel was a soldier who was injured in action and ended up being experimented on instead of being properly treated. He wanted the government to be held accountable and was holding government officials hostage in Quebec, Canada. Wolverine's mission was to deal with the situation, extract the superhuman threat, and secure the hostages. He didn't know that Citadel himself was also a potential victim until it was too late, and the government stepped in to cart Citadel off without Wolverine being able to do or say much about it. Number 4, Abdul Al Hazarad. Fun fact 
asks, did you know that Abdul Al Hazarad in HP Lovecraft lore is the character credited with the creation of the Necronomicon? Yeah, huh, he is. And as such, he is also acknowledged as being its creator in the Marvel Universe as well. He and Wolverine came to blows in Madripoor when Abdul was trying to take over Tiger Tiger's crime syndicate. Abdul attempted to attack Wolverine with a demon, but in the end, Wolverine survived and Abdul ended up trapped in the same demonic realm his demon pals had come from. Sucks to suck, I guess. Number three, Damage. For those who are unfamiliar with Damage, he's basically Marvel's version of the Terminator. There's a lot of parallels there, anyways. He was originally the human Jamie Ortiz. The Kingpin turned him into a cybernetic being after Damage was brought to the brink of death by Punisher. Kingpin later gave Damage cosmetic surgery to make him look identical to the Punisher as well, and used him against Frank Castle, attempting to break Castle and ruin the Punisher's name by having Damage kill a bunch of innocent people. Wolverine and Damage both ripped one another apart in a fight, and when Punisher finally showed up, he finished Damage off by setting him on fire. Number 2. Geist Nikolaus Geist was a mad scientist from Germany working on the side of the Axis during World War II. He was working to create a new type of super soldier for Germany, similar to the United States super soldier Captain America aka Steve Rogers. Roughhouse was his main test subject, and in the end, Wolverine was the one to free Roughhouse and put a stop to Geist. Geist was also a cyborg, but Wolverine cut off his metal shell in an attempt to kill him. It was later revealed that while he was suspected dead and was incapacitated after this fight, he did however manage to survive. However, soon after, another mutant, Magneto, did kill him, so he dead. Number 1. Rough House Going back again to the days of battle in Madripoor for who would get to be the king or queen of crime and in effect rule Madripoor, Wolverine found himself allied with Yasan Hoan, aka Tiger Tiger. It was also during this time that he first fought with Roughhouse, who made his first appearance in issue 4 of Wolverine series from 1988. Roughhouse was allied with General Koi and got his superpowers from either his relation to the mythical race of Asgardians or from being a mutant, or maybe a bit of both. It's a little foggy. Though they are enemies and remain enemies thereafter, Wolverine did still save Roughhouse from Geist because experimenting on people in Logan's book is just plain wrong. And I think in everyone's book, let's not experiment on people. Can we all agree on that? Number 10, Nuclear Man. Regarded by many as one of the strangest and most half baked Superman villains to date, Nuclear Man hasn't had too many appearances outside of his introduction in 1987 Superman 4 The Quest for Peace. He was created by Lex Luthor from a strand of hair containing Superman's DNA, which he threw into a genetic stew. Superman is actually the one responsible for this villain's birth, though, as he wasn't fully born until Superman threw the nuclear missile containing the device that had the stew in it into the sun. Having been created using Kryptonian DNA, he possesses powers similar to Superman, such as invulnerability, energy projection, flight, and of course the standard super strength and speed. However, Nuclear Man needs to have constant exposure to sunlight in order to use them. If he's left out of the sun for too long, he becomes completely immobilized and must wait for some more sunlight in order to recharge. In the movie, Superman stopped Nuclear Man for good by causing a sudden solar eclipse when he moved the moon in front of the sun, then dropped him into the heart of a nuclear reactor where he could become an abundant source of energy for the remainder of his days. Now, like I said before, Nuclear Man hasn't made too many appearances outside of Superman 4, but if you want to see him in comic book form, check him out in his one-off appearance in 2018, Superman Volume 5, Number 2. Number 9, Microwave Man. Lewis Padgett from Earth 1, known as the costume baddie Microwave Man, has a pretty interesting story despite only appearing in two issues back in 1978. Padgett spent 40 years traveling around the galaxy aboard an alien spacecraft before returning back to Earth in October of 1978. Now, not much is known about his life before his interstellar journey other than the fact that he was already known as the villain Microwave Man. Upon his return, Padgett calls upon his alien friends one last time to grant him back his youth, even though doing this would shorten his remaining life to only a few more hours. This didn't seem to bother him, and once he was young again, Padgett assumed the identity of Microwave Man once more and challenged Superman. Now, Padgett's alien friends inform Superman that he only wants the glory of defeating him and will die very soon, so Superman, like the upstanding good guy that he is, allows Padgett to defeat him in a test of strength, after which he dies satisfied, and the aliens come to claim his body to set adrift in space as he had once requested. Making his first appearance in 1978's Action Comics number 487, why not check his short run out for yourself? 
Number eight, the puzzler. So little is known about either version of the puzzler, so don't feel bad if you're not familiar with this character or just generally don't know who they are. The first to take up this name was Valerie Van Haften, a longtime admirer of Superman and someone who wanted nothing more than to get his attention. So she had the idea of becoming a heroine with the intent of one day joining his team. This proved to be a lot harder than she thought and she quickly turned to crime instead and eventually joined the likes of the Secret Six to get a get out of hell free card. Her powers are actually pretty cool as she's made up of a bunch of indestructible puzzles pieces that she has full control over, allowing her to deconstruct at will and even fling the pieces at her opponents like a bullet. Now, the second puzzler is from the Prime Earth and is actually known as Puzzler Bot, a creation of that universe's puzzler that mimics the abilities of its creator through technological assimilation. That's about it when it comes to these characters, so if you know any more, please let me know in the comments below. But in the meantime, check them out for yourself in 2002 Superman Volume 2, number 187, and 2013's Justice League of America, Volume 3, number 3. Number 7, Bloodsport. Now, unfortunately, a cool name doesn't always make for a cool villain. We've seen a few of Lex Luthor's henchmen take up the name Bloodsport, but let's focus on the first, Robert Dubois. Dubois suffered a mental breakdown after his brother had taken his place in the Vietnam War and became a quadruple amputee, resulting in Dubois spending 12 years bouncing between various psychiatric hospitals. Somehow, an agent of Lex Luthor persuades Dubois that Superman is to blame for all his troubles causing him to adopt the name Bloodsport and go on a needless rampage in downtown Metropolis. Equipped with basic hand-to-hand -hand combat skills and some unnamed tech from Luther that allowed him to summon any weapon he desired from a remote location, Dubois caused some serious damage before being subdued after his brother confronted him. He spent several years in Stryker Island's penitentiary before Alex Trent, the person who took up the name Bloodsport after him, was brought to his attention. Believing it was the healthiest way for the two to work out their problems, the warden set up a boxing match between the two with Superman as the referee. However, Things got out of hand pretty quickly and a riot broke out that allowed Dubois to escape. His freedom didn't last very long though as he was quickly shot down by a prison guard. Check out his story for yourself starting with 1987 Superman Volume 2, Number 4. Number 6, Bruno Mannheim. Bruno Ugly Mannheim had the honor or I don't know, maybe Dishonor, depending on how you look at it, of being introduced not in a Superman comic, but in the spin-off series Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen. Manheim starts us off as a pretty run-of-the-mill stereotypical gangster, trying to just stake a claim for himself in Metropolis, but eventually morphs into something very different and ultimately confusing. With no real powers, unless you consider greed and brutality to be special, Manheim was beefed up by DC when he was made leader of the Intergang a worldwide crime syndicate that answers to no one other than Darkseid. Basically, Mannheim is this interesting amalgamation of some of the best villains out there, as he is known to go full-blown Hannibal Lecter sometimes, you know, eating his enemies slash subordinates that disobey him, and he also flip-flops between being a super genius like Lex Luthor to an overwhelming powerhouse like Darkseid. Yeah, I know, it's all a little bit confusing, so why not check him out for yourself so you can make some more sense of his character, starting with his first appearance in 1971's Superman's pal, Jimmy Olsen, number 139. Number 5, The Prankster. Once the extremely popular host of the Uncle Oswald show, Oswald Loomis became the prankster after his show was cancelled and ultimately ended his career in comedy. His first assault on Metropolis was an all-out barrage of practical jokes that ended in his surrender. After a while, Loomis resurfaced with a much younger and athletic body thanks to selling his soul to Lord Satanus, and this changed everything. With a more serious personality and affinity for dangerous tricks, Loomis basically became a slightly less twisted version of the Joker, and his only goal was to make the world laugh via his own twisted ways. When Metropolis was taken over by Brainiac 13, he took advantage of all the futuristic tech available and upgraded his existing gadgets, which proved to be pretty effective against even the likes of Superman. However, this was probably because the Man of Steel was suffering from kryptonite poisoning at the time and did not have full access to his powers. Skip ahead a little bit to when the Joker took over the world and we meet a slightly altered Halloween mask wearing prankster who acts as Joker City's exorcist, whose goal is to expel the evil from those who still believe in science. Thankfully for everyone out there, he was eventually apprehended by Superman and taken to Belle Reve to serve his time for all his crimes. Having made his first appearance all the way back in 1988 Superman Volume 2 number 16, give his story a read for yourself and let me know what you think in the comments below. Number 4, Lois Lane Robot. On New Earth and during his quest for the power he lost in Blackest Night, Lex Luthor decided it was a good idea to take a Brainiac probe stored in LexCorp and a sample of Lois Lane's DNA to create a robotic version of her that would serve as his quote unquote conscience. Unfortunately for him, before he was able to complete the programming, he was held hostage by some bandits under the control of Mr. Mind, and he himself was put into a mental illusion. The Lois Lane robot was functional enough though to activate all of its weapon systems, allowing it to take out all of the thugs and bring Luthor back into reality. Armed to the brim with state-of-the-art technology, 
technology and weapons, her robotic android body allows her to repair any damage received and also gives her the ability to fly alongside super strength, durability, and speed. Now, not long after their run-in with Mr. Mind, Luther, Deathstroke, and Lanebot head to Antarctica to find a black orb that is somehow related to the Black Power Ring energy. The effects of this orb were enough to cause Deathstroke and his men to completely lose control and attack one another. However, Lanebot was not affected as she is inorganic. That was the last time we saw the Lois Lane robot, so until they grace the comic book pages once again, check them out in their first appearance in 2010's Action Comics number 890. Number 3, Terra Man. Tobias Manning, aka Terra Man, was once a businessman who one day realized just how much damage he was causing to the Earth and its environment. With his newfound conscience, Manning took up a personal vendetta against any company that was causing damage to the environment. Using weapons that focused on turning the environment around his enemies against them, he has caused some serious damage in the name of the Earth, and that earned him a spot on the Secret Society of Villains during the events of Infinite Crisis. Even after this catastrophic event, Terra Man continued his nefarious ways by hijacking a plane over the Middle East. Thanks to Black Adam, he escaped both harm and capture for this crime, however, in hindsight, teaming up with Black Adam probably wasn't the best idea for him, because when Black Adam later appeared to address the media in front of Condock's New York Embassy, he ripped Terra Man in half with no warning, and that was the end of this nature-loving villain, until he was resurrected during the events of The Blackest Night. Why not give his story a read for yourself, starting with his first appearance all the way back in 1990's Superman Volume 2, number 46. Number 2, Hellspont. Although he was originally created as the nemesis of the Wildcats in the Wildstorm universe, Hellspont made his way onto the villain roster for Superman when that universe was brought into the DC universe in the New 52 relaunch. As a Daemonite, Hellspont possesses a ridiculous amount of powers thanks to his alien physiology such as, but definitely not limited to, chronokinesis, accelerated healing, and telepathy. And when combined with his Akurian host body, he is shown to possess super strength and speed that are able to outmatch even the Man of Steel himself. Hellspawn made his first documented move against humanity by trying to start a nuclear war between the most powerful nations on Earth in order to allow humanity to destroy itself so the planet would be empty for the Daemonites. However, this plan didn't really pan out as he was stopped by Team One and Mr. Majestic. In the rebooted Wildstorm universe, Hellspawn is now a super evolved living hive mind because apparently when the number of Daemonites reaches a certain number, a central mind is created. Hellspawn now has the knowledge and intelligence of every member of the entire Daemonite race, and its synthetic body is a rad looking mix of flesh, metal, and fire. Thanks to this, he has moved into a league of his own when it comes to power, however, we are still waiting to see it all in action. Now, I did have to skip over a lot of cool stuff regarding this character, so check out his story for yourself, starting with his first appearance in 1992's Wildcats number one. And coming in at number one, we have Conduit. Kenny Braverman was, funnily enough, born on the same day that Superman's ship arrived on Earth. His fate was not exactly as lucky as our Man of Steel's. While his parents were on the way to the hospital, they ended up having to pull over to the side of the road due to the heavy storm, and he was born curbside, incredibly close to Clark's ship. And the exposure to the kryptonite caused some side effects that would manifest later in life. All throughout their younger years, Clark and Kenny were rivals, competing in everything from sports to girls, and this probably caused some serious self-esteem issues for Kenny because Clark always seemed to come out on top. After high school, Kenny went on to join the CIA and grew more and more reckless as his dormant abilities started to change his personality. Turns out Kenny's body is basically a living conduit for all energy, and it can process, manipulate, and even generate forms of energy in many destructive ways. Upon realizing this, Kenny took up the mantle of conduit and decided it was finally time to get his revenge on Clark. However, all of his attempts seemed to fail. Later confronted by Superman, Kenny deduced that Clark and the Man of Steel were one and the same, which was perfect for him because they were literally the only people he wanted to kill. So, he set all his sights on getting rid of Superman. Kenny manages to catch Superman and traps him in a mock version of Smallville, and the two face off one-on-one -on -one in a replica of their childhood football stadium. Unfortunately for Kenny, he succumbed to his madness and supercharged himself with kryptonite energy, effectively overloading his powers and killing him in the process. Why not give Conduit's story a read for yourself, starting with his first appearance all the way back in 1994's Superman, The Man of Steel number zero, and let me know what you think in the comments below. Number 10, The Actor. Now, I've heard of method actors, but this definitely takes the meaning to a whole other level. An ace infiltrator whose real identity is unknown, that worked for the Russians back when they were an evil empire. Like Spider-Man's nemesis the Chameleon, the actor can perfectly impersonate anyone, and he was quite successful at stealing state secrets until he ran up against 
Tony Stark. The actor traveled to the United States and disguised as Stark easily entered Stark Industries where he succeeded in not only obtaining some important blueprints but also discovered that Tony Stark himself was Iron Man. The actor left feeling satisfied with his work and left cleanup duty to his agents. However, Tony was able to overcome them very easily and ended up traveling to the USSR to pose as the actor to foil their evil plans. And talk about a role reversal, am I right? When the real actor returned to his employer, the Red Barbarian, he was shot right as he came because he was deemed a traitor. This didn't actually kill him though because he later resurfaced to work for the Red Barbarian to once again take down Tony Stark. Why not check him out for yourself in his first appearance in 1963's Tales of Suspense number 42. Number 9, The Melter. Bruno Horgan was once an American industrialist specializing in weapons for the US military until a government inspection revealed he was using shoddy materials, and you can probably guess why that's not really good. Tony Stark scooped up his defense contracts because, you know, his weapons actually worked, and a bankrupt Horgan decided the only rational thing to do was to blame Tony for sabotaging his work and ruining his life. Luckily for him, and unlucky for literally everyone else, he found himself among his ruined company's assets, a weapon prototype that generated a beam capable of melting iron on contact, and this began his evil reign as the Melter. Tony was able to defeat this villain pretty easily, however, he was still deemed enough of a threat to create a new suit made out of aluminum, and good thing he did because in his second encounter with the Melter, that completely saved him. Skip ahead a little bit and we see the Melter return with a new version of his Melting Ray and team up with Whiplash and the Blizzard to take down Tony Stark under the orders of Justin Hammer. Tony was able to overcome all three of the villains alongside Cave and Horgan was sent to Rikers Island where he met a nuclear physicist that helped him further augment his equipment so that it would work against Iron Man's aluminum armor. Fast forward just a little bit more and we see the Melter reach the end of his journey at the hands of Scourge who was posing as his assistant. Take a look at this character story for yourself starting with 1963's Tales of Suspense number 47. Number 8, Gargantus. Before Iron Man found his groove fighting industrial spies and the occasional world conqueror, he was stuck duking it out with alien robots like Gargantus. Created by an unknown and unnamed alien race that had been scouting the Earth for the past 80,000 years, Gargantus was built in the image of a Neanderthal because that was the only species that the aliens had encountered. It first arrived in the town of Granville and used its hypnotizing eyes to conquer the townspeople, but the aliens' plans were quickly foiled by Iron Man, who was alerted by the invasion because one of the young women trapped by Gargantus didn't show up for their date, and nobody stands up Tony Stark, so he knew something was up. After a little back and forth with the robot, Tony figured out that Gargantus was actually a robot and decided to surround it with powerful magnets that tore it apart completely because, you know, magnets. After the aliens realize that maybe the Earth's defenses are too good, they decide to fly away and we don't hear about them again until 1999's Captain America, Sentinel of Liberty, Volume 1, Number 5. Fun fact, Gargantus is technically the first villain Iron Man ever faced, so why not check it out in its first appearance all the way back in 1963's Tales of Suspense number 40, and let me know what you think of this caveman robot in the comments below. Number 7, Termite. I'm sure we all know the classic way that most people gain their powers in comics, you know, an accident happens and instead of dying, they gain abilities. Pretty standard, right? Well, I think Marvel was a little bit tired of that because Neil Donaldson was just born with his ability to disintegrate whatever he touches. After discovering his powers, he was hired by Obadiah Stane to eliminate the competition. However, James Rhodes, the acting Iron Man at the time, quickly got word of this and set out to take the termite down. During his third fight with the villain, the first two ending with the termite escaping, Rhodes was seemingly evenly matched with him until Tony Stark showed up with the mutant power neutralizer and shot the termite with it, removing his powers completely, allowing him to be arrested and taken to jail. Word of this got back to Stane and he hired the Enforcer to take him out. However, the Enforcer was taken out first by the Scourge of the Underworld, so basically the termite was saved completely by accident. The termite was later seen sulking in jail and that's really the last we've seen of him. Check out this villain for yourself in his first appearance all the way back in 1984's Iron Man number 189. Number 6, Vibro. Alton Vibro was your average seismologist until he fell into the San Andreas Fault while testing an experimental machine, and of course he ends up with super vibrating powers because this is the Marvel Universe, and like I said a little bit ago, if you have an accident in the Marvel Universe, then you're probably going to end up with some sick powers. These powers allowed Alton to generate high-level seismic vibrations and fire them from his hands, causing shockwaves, opening chasms, and generating earthquakes. Thinking his employer Frank and Fortney was to blame for his accident, he sought revenge on him and thus began his villain career as Vibro. After after two battles with James Rhodes, the acting Iron Man at the time, Vibro was eventually taken down with the help of Tony Stark in the Mark I Iron Man armor. Vibro hasn't only been a problem for Iron Man though, and he has also gone up against the Falcon, Nomad, Shield, the Avengers West Coast, and even Wolverine. We later see him team up with the Mandarin alongside a bunch of other Avengers to once again try and take down the Armored Avenger. Making his first appearance all the way back in 1984's Iron Man number 186, why not give this villain's story a read for yourself? 
Number five, Doctor Strange. Now, I know what you're thinking, and no, I'm not talking about Stephen Strange, the Sorcerer Supreme and Master of the Mystic Arts. I'm talking about Carlos Strange, who made his first and last appearance all the way back in 1963's Tales of Suspense number 41. Carlos Strange was just your typical mad scientist, creating and concocting all manners of weaponry in his mountain hideout when a lightning bolt struck him, increasing the electrical energy inside his brain, making him smarter and even madder than before. Six months after the whole lightning incident, Strange built an ultra-frequency transmitter from radio and television parts and used it to take mental control of Iron Man, forcing him to free him from his prison so he can enact his plan to take over the world and just give it to his daughter. Threatening to destroy the entire planet in 24 hours unless every nation surrenders to him, he launched a powerful bomb into the atmosphere to demonstrate just how serious he was. Iron Man quickly found his way to Strange's new hideout in the Atlantic and destroyed his main power source, effectively ruining his plan. With no other option, Strange withdrew and escaped custody and we're honestly not too sure what he's cooking up now. Check out his story for yourself and let me know what you think of his character in the comments below. Number 4, The Chessman. Like so many criminal masterminds out there, Obadiah Stane was a bit too obsessed with the whole chess as a metaphor for controlling life's thing. So much so that he hired assassins who literally dressed themselves as chess pieces, you know, like pawns, bishops, knights, and rooks, with him acting as their king. The knight got a flying robot horse, the rook used a castle full of death traps, and the bishop, well, now that I think about it, he didn't do a whole lot. He was really only able to manipulate his opponent's actions. One by one, the chessmen went up against Iron Man with none of them actually succeeding in taking him down. However, that didn't seem to be Stane's plan. The string of encounters and events actually led to Tony's addiction to alcohol to worsen, and this allowed him to buy Stark Industries and push Tony out of the Iron Man mantle for a while. Tony eventually got his act together and went up against the chess-themed team once more and emerged victorious, with Stane taking his own life with a repulsor blast. Check out these villainous pawns for yourself, starting with their first appearance in 1982's Iron Man number 163. Number 3, Mr. Doll. Now I know what you're thinking, and no, his first name wasn't Ken, that would just be way too good of a joke. Nathan Dolly was a pretty average dealer in curios and art objects until he came across an extraordinary doll during his time in Africa. He discovered that he could reshape this doll to re resemble whomever he wanted, and that he could cause that person to feel immense pain by manipulating the doll's features. He decided the best way to use his new voodoo doll was to coerce rich business people into legally signing over control of their business to him, which worked pretty great for him until he decided to go after Tony Stark. Tony found it tough to fight against this villain because initially he was unable to withstand the pain caused by the doll. So in true Tony Stark fashion, he built a suit just for the occasion. Now able to withstand the power, Tony used a force beam to change the doll's likeness into that of Mr. Doll's, and the immense pain this caused Mr. Doll caused him to pass out, allowing for his capture and arrest. Fast forward a bit and we see Mr. Doll once again, however this time his consciousness is trapped and split between two mannequins, Jake and William, aka the Brothers Grimm. This didn't last for too long though because he was eventually beaten by Spider-Woman and his consciousness dispersed for good. Take a look at the voodoo doll wielding Mr. Doll for yourself in his first appearance in 1963's Tales of Suspense number 48. Number 2, The Unicorn. Milos Masaryk was a Soviet intelligence agent assigned to security detail at the laboratory of an inventor who was developing advanced weaponry. One of the inventor's projects was a helmet that could discharge destructive energy blasts from something called the Power Horn, and Milos came into possession of this helmet after his inventor hightailed it to the US, thus starting his mission as the Unicorn of avenging the disgrace caused by the inventor's defection. His first encounter with Iron Man really isn't much to write home about since Tony let the villain walk away scot-free. However, several months later, after a not-so-healthy dose of brainwashing and augmentation, Milos returned to the US with the goal of doing whatever it takes to reverse an unfortunate side effect of his treatment. However, Iron Man was able to thwart his plans once again. The Unicorn teamed up with the Red Ghost, the Mandarin, and even Titanium Man, all of them promising to find a cure for him if he defeated Iron Man. However, obviously none of them were actually going to follow through with that. Flash forward a bit and we see the Unicorn once again make his way to the US to bring down Stark Tower alongside Spymaster and some other baddies. This was a bit of a weird time for Iron Man and the Unicorn because near the end of this arc the two actually ended up teaming up to take down Captain Atlas. However, after they were done they went back to being not so friendly with each other. Take a look at this magically named villain for yourself starting with their first appearance all the way back in 1964's Tales of Suspense number 56. Number 1, The Blood Brothers. Like so many great Marvel heroes before him, there was a brief time when Iron Man was flying around having cosmic adventures with space aliens. When Thanos first appeared in the Iron Man comics, we were introduced to some of his henchmen as well, two of them being the Blood Brothers, Guri and Rahas Blood. The alien siblings acted as Thanos' as guardians of his Earth base, however, they were easily defeated by the Thing and Iron Man, and this just disgusted Thanos to the core, so he sent them away for a while to an unknown location. Years later, they made it back to Earth to try and get revenge on Iron Man, but they were defeated once again and ended 
ended up locked in Riker's Island. Fast forward a little bit and we see Rahas die and Guri go on solo, eventually becoming a part of the Hood's criminal army. Guri later had his cosmic potential unleashed and this gave him a crazy power up, and he became one of these slaughter lords under the name Brother Blood. Now it's not really said when, but at some point Rahas came back to life and the Bread Brothers reunited once again and joined a new incarnation of the Lethal Legion as a part of a contest that was assembled by the Grand Master. All these fights around the world were thwarted by the Avengers though, including the Blood Brothers fight in Rome, and the Lethal Legion regrouped, escaped to nowhere, and decided to stay together as a team just to see what they could accomplish together. Check out this villainous brotherly bond for yourself starting with 1973's Iron Man number 55 and try to name a better duo in the comments. Oh wait. Number 10, Mavis. Yep, just Mavis. Mavis was the villain in the third and final story featured in Wonder Woman issue 4 from the original run of the series. In issue 4, she was the former slave of the then reformed Paula Von Gunther. Once freed, however, Mavis did not want to be reformed on Reform Island like the other girls. No, I'm not kidding. Reform Island is a smaller island that is part of Themyscira, later referred to as Transformation Island. Instead, Mavis plotted to get revenge on her former mistress. She kidnapped Paula's daughter Greta and attempted to persuade Paula to once again join the German World War II forces, resuming her villainous work. Fortunately, Wonder Woman rescues Greta, apprehends Mavis, and saves the day. Number 9. Decay. Decay was a nemesis created for Wonder Woman by Phobos, Ares' son. While Wonder Woman attempted to foil Ares' schemes, Phobos saw the opportunity to win his father's favor by destroying Diana. He ventured to the Cavern of the Gorgons and, using the magical properties and matter of the Gorgon's heart, created a villain in its image, much like Diana herself had been created. He sent the fiend called Decay to Wonder Woman and the two fought one another. While Decay proved a formidable foe, almost defeating Wonder Woman, in the end it was Diana's lasso of truth that ended the being. Due to the lasso ties to Gaia and life, it overwhelmed Decay who was born of death with its life infused energy until Decay exploded, reduced once more to the dust form from whence she came. Number 8. Professor Menace While Professor Menace has also appeared in the DC animated universe, people might not be as familiar with him when it comes to the comics. He only appeared in a handful of issues there. He makes an appearance in the good old original run of Wonder Woman in issue 111, where he attempts to replace Wonder Woman with a robotic duplicate. Known to Diana as simply the robot master, he challenges her to a competition to prove that his robotic duplicate is in fact better than even she herself. Wonder Woman accepts the challenge, but the competition is rigged in the robot's favor. Defeated, she agrees, as previously decided, should she lose, to go into retirement. It is then revealed that Robot Master is actually the insidious Dr. Menace, a supervillain. Not content with simply convincing Wonder Woman to retire, he sends the robot after her. I think this is really where he, he messed up and made a bad choice. Wonder Woman uses an eel to short circuit her robotic counterpart defeating Dr. Menace. That's very resourceful Wonder Woman using an eel. Number 7. Osira During the time of ancient Egypt, Osira arrived on planet Earth. She was an alien from another galaxy with insane telepathic powers. During her time in Egypt, she used her powers to rule over the people there becoming their queen, with her consort becoming their king. Eventually the people of Egypt rebelled against her, sealing her up in a pyramid. Years later, during World War II, she was accidentally freed from her tomb. She attempted to use her telepathic power to bring peace and end World War II. War II through influencing the minds of those fighting. Actually a pretty noble cause, but Wonder Woman and the Justice Society of America weren't going to let Osira control people, even if it was for the purpose of peace. Wonder Woman defeated Osira by using Starman's gravity rod to break her telepathic hold and basically defeated her by convincing Osira of the importance of free will above even peace. Since her first appearance in that two story arc in Wonder Woman Volume 1 issue 231 and 232, Osira has made a few more appearances, mostly reappearing as an antagonist in Wonder Woman giant size issues. Number 6. Armageddon Armageddon is actually a legacy villain, but despite the fact that there have been multiple Armageddons, it's still likely not a name that most people would be super familiar with. Originally Armageddon fought alongside Germany during World War II on the side of the Axis. He was first introduced in the 1970s in issue 234 of the original Wonder Woman comic. Despite not having any specific superpowers, he was still considered to be a relatively strong foe, skilled in using many different types of weapons. His son and and his granddaughter thereafter would also end up taking the villainous mantle of Armageddon, explaining his strength and theirs as coming from being descended from the mythical beings known as ogres. With Armageddon the third first appearing in Wonder Woman legacy numbered issue 753 earlier this year. Number 5. Angleman 
You may have forgotten about Angleman and his angler, but don't worry, we won't let you forget. Angleman has never been considered an A-list villain, likely because he is such a ridiculous name. Although it does begin with an A, oddly enough. And he often fights with what looks like some kind of protractor. But his angler, as it's known, is actually a very powerful piece of equipment, which can be used to manipulate space and time. Although I'm sure it could also be used as a ruler or to help measure angles in a pinch. Multi-purpose. Since his introduction as Angelo Ben, a brilliant and often technologically capable criminal who sometimes dressed up as a stage magician, he has been rebooted and is now known for also being Vandal Savage's son. Number 4. Darren O. Donna Troy's origins are always an interesting and kind Kind of ever changing story, as each DC reboot seems to revamp the origins of where the original Wonder Girl came from. During the Wonder Woman series that started in 2011, the story once again got a refresh of sorts when Darano was introduced. Darano was the lover of Hippolyta, who was turned into an old crone, drained of all her youth and beauty, and ended up deciding instead to live out her days mostly in seclusion. When she learned that Hippolyta had a child with Zeus, the baby that would one day grow up to become Wonder Woman, she set out to make a better heir for the people of Themyscira. Thus, Donna Troy was created. Darano helped Donna to vie for the throne, and the two almost succeeded in usurping Wonder Woman's position as inheritor. Fortunately, Wonder Woman defeated Donna and managed to sway her into becoming her ally, using the power of truth. Darano attempted to kill Wonder Woman for this, but was stopped by the other Amazons. Number 3. The Children of Ares Ares has a lot of children, and most of them have beef with Diana, but this group of them were specifically known as the Children of Ares, and aren't any of the main, bigger ones that you might have heard of before. They are a team of children and villains created by Gail Simone and Bernard Chang, who first appeared in the 2006 run of Wonder Woman in issue 39. They were only around for a few issues, but were sired by Ares, who magically impregnated Amazonian women. These children use their mind, control abilities, and manipulation skills to discredit Diana, tarnishing her reputation as a hero and as Wonder Woman. Number 2. Deimos Deimos is known for being another one of the children of Ares, separate from the previous group group of five we just discussed. He first appeared in the original run of Wonder Woman in issue 183. He is the twin brother of Phobos who created Decay. Together these brothers attempted to battle Diana after Phobos' plan of using Decay failed. Deimos planned to poison Wonder Woman in battle with his snake like hair, which infected those it touched with a fear inducing toxin. In the end however, Wonder Woman beat him by decapitating him with her often underused tiara. That thing is sharp. Number 1. Villainy Incorporated Villainy Incorporated was a group of women who were former villains of Wonder Woman's trapped together on Transformation Island, also known as Reform Island, as we talked about before, they ended up teaming up in order to escape their dismal fate in issue number 28 of the 1942 Wonder Woman series. Together, they managed to capture and overpower Wonder Woman, but as they tried to escape, Wonder Woman managed to break her bonds and recapture the rebellious prisoners. While you may recognize some of the villains on the Villainy Inc. team, not all are easily recognizable. You might know Cheetah or Dr. Poison or even Giganta, but how about Blue Snowman, Hypnotic Woman, Queen Clea, Zara, or one of my favorites? It's Evil S? Pretty sure Evil S was also the leader of that team. Number 10, Wacky Man. Although not inherently evil, this unnamed clown of a man is still considered to be an Aquaman villain. Wacky Man was a clown that used robotic versions of aquatic creatures in his act, and because of that, he decided to model his costume after Aquaman's. He was actually a pretty decent clown, bringing in people from all over to see his act. However, this wasn't always the best thing because he eventually caught the attention of some pirates who kidnapped him and forced him to use his robotic sea creatures to not only commit crimes, but to go after the real Aquaman. He proved to be someone who was not truly evil though because once freed from the pirates, he teamed up with Aquaman. Aquaman to take them down. Check him out in his only appearance in 1957's Adventure Comics number 233 and let me know in the comments below if you think he truly deserves to be considered a villain for that. Number 9. Clownfish Sidney Allard was once a doctor with a pretty shady practice. He was killing his elderly patients and just covering it up as much as he could. After part of San Diego sank, Allard was recruited by Black Manta and was tasked with taking blood samples of every resident in now Sub Diego. This included Aquaman, Aquagirl, and Cal Durham. After those three were rescued, Allard slipped away seamlessly and started looting a room full of chemicals. However, he stumbled a little bit and ended up breaking a vial that contained a strain of the Joker toxin. Engulfed in the toxin, Allard completely lost his sanity, took inspiration from a fish in a bowl, and colored his entire body purple and yellow, and then from then on dubbed himself the Clown Fish. He then decided to break into Calderum's home and shoot his partner Kaisa Salton with a mini harpoon, and then strapped a bomb to her torso. 
Obviously Aquaman arrived on the scene to save Kaisha, but Allard seemed to be prepared for that because he was somehow able to make Aquaman take a truth serum drug so that he could find a way to get rid of him for good. Thankfully Aquaman was able to sober up before he answered any questions though. Having failed, Allard pushes the trigger for the bomb, however it's revealed that the one strapped to Kaisha was a fake, and the real one was hidden under the couch. Now everyone was saved by Aquaman before the explosion and Clownfish made a clean getaway. Check out his story for yourself starting with his first appearance in 2007's Aquaman Sword of Atlantis. Number 8, The Awesome Threesome. Known together as the Awesome Threesome, Torpedo Man, Claw, and Magneto, but not the one that you're thinking of, were a team of robotic villains who ends up against Aquaman and his Aqua family. Debuting in 1967's Aquaman Volume 1 number 36, this villainous team was telepathically summoned to attack a science hall, but it turns out they picked the wrong day to do it though because Aquaman, Mera, Aqualad, and Aqua Baby were all visiting the pavilion and sprung into action the moment they heard all the commotion. Magneto destroyed the Gyro Moleculizer, which was trapping a convicted alien on Earth for 5,000 years. With the molecularizer destroyed, the alien was free to escape and release his control on the robots. The threesome was apprehended quickly, however the alien escaped to Atlantis and began causing some serious damage to the city. It was able to then make a quick getaway thanks to a flying saucer, and once away, it then released its mind control from the three robots once again, and they were back to their old villainous selves. Check out this robotic team of villains for yourself in their first appearance in 1967's Aquaman Volume 1, number 36. Number 7, Fisherman. An international criminal who started off as a thief who would steal anything he could get his hands on and sell them to the highest bidder. He came in contact with Aquaman after stealing a formula that could enlarge any living matter and ever since then, the two have been enemies. Fast forward a little bit and we see the fisherman clash with Aquaman on multiple occasions, each time ending in his defeat and he eventually takes up residence in the villain friendly country of Zandia. That was however just the first iteration of the fisherman however because there have been a few fishermen over the years. And that's because he is actually a parasite that takes over a host and forces them to commit crimes and do his bidding. The second iteration attacked the Gotham police during the Infinite Crisis alongside Scavenger, Red Pansy, and Riddler, and was shot down by Marcus Driver. And the third was actually just an imposter fisherman that was revealed to be a Xenoform parasite that controlled its host using fear. Take a look at this character for yourself, starting with their first appearance in 1965's Aquaman, number 21. Number 6, Human Flying Fish. One day, way back in the day, Victor Bragg and Dr. Krill saw Aquaman using his fish telepathy to catch a bunch of baddies. Krill turned to Bragg and convinced him to undergo a special operation to turn him into a human flying fish, because Krill believed that Aquaman would not be able to stop him from that. With his newfound abilities of enhanced speed, flight, and ability to breathe underwater, Bragg was able to outperform Aquaman and escape on every mission he was sent out on. It took a little bit, but Aquaman was eventually able to figure out Bragg's tactics and devise a plan to trap him. Luring him in with a rumor of a bounty of uranium that was somewhere lost at sea, he took the bait and attempted to find it. The human flying fish was then taken out by Aquaman using electric eels, and he alongside Dr. Krill were arrested and taken away. Bragg was later seen as a criminal for hire, but was taken out rather quickly by Joseph Curry, the new Aquaman, and honestly hasn't really been seen since. Take a look at his story for yourself, starting with his first appearance in 1960's Adventure Comics number 272. Number 5, Animal Master. Gustav was just once a regular old animal trainer who made a pretty decent living traveling the world as a circus performer. Like many other performers though, fame and fortune started to get to his head and it got to a point where he began training his animals to commit crimes for him. Having been able to escape the cops on most heists, he began to get cocky and decided to escape by boat and then this allowed Aquaman to enter the scene, however, he wasn't able to catch him this time around. This was both a blessing in disguise and a curse for Gustav because although he escaped, a terrible storm hit the area and completely destroyed his boat. Presumed to be dead by everyone including Aquaman, Gustav was actually very much alive and had found his way to a desert island where he tirelessly trained the animals he found on the island so he could enact his revenge on Aquaman. He was eventually able to lure Aquaman to his island but he couldn't beat him and that ended in his arrest. Check out Animal Master for yourself in his first appearance in 1959's Adventure Comics number 261. Number 4, Laren. Residing in the realm known as Dimension Aqua, Laren possesses pretty much all the powers you would expect from Aquaman, just toned down a fair amount. Long ago, he led a revolt against the Queen Mera and forced her to flee to Earth, which is kind of a good thing because that's where she met Aquaman. Laren ended up following her and was able to capture Aquaman and Aqualad and brought them back to Dimension Aqua as prisoners. Thankfully, Aquaman was able to figure out a plan of action pretty quickly and he alongside Mera and the rest were able to escape back to Atlantis, which just solidified Laren's position as the new ruler of the Dimension Aqua. A few years later, Mera ended up returning to Dimension Aqua and had discovered that Laren had gotten rid of all of her tools and tossed them into the Great Pit. This forced her to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Laren and she was able to overpower him, shattering his mind in the process, leaving him completely and utterly useless. 
If you feel like it, give this villain story a read for yourself, starting with his first appearance in 1963's Aquaman, number 11. Number 3, Captain Demo. Although his real identity is unknown, Captain Demo is a high-tech underwater pirate whose crew specializes in using very deadly and very experimental weaponry. Demo drives a fully functioning 16th century pirate ship that somehow works perfectly underwater, and of course when you drive a 16th century ship, you have to dress the part. It's also not really explained how, but he and his crew are able to breathe perfectly underwater without the need for scuba gear or anything like that. Deciding one day to conquer Atlantis, he managed to rig the entire city to explode unless Aquaman submitted to him, to which he complied and ended up doing some truly terrible things. When he finally got the chance, Aquaman turned on Demo and knocked him out cold in a one-on-one -on -one fist fight. Toppo the Octopus also helped out and he took out the majority of Demo's men, however enough of them were able to band together and rescue their captain so that they could live to fight another day. Check out Captain Demo for yourself starting with his first appearance in 1975's Adventure Comics number 441. Number 2, Scavenger. Peter Mortimer was a deep sea diver and pirate who dubbed himself the Scavenger because, you know, he scavenges. With no real powers, he operated an advanced submersible vessel called the Scorpion Ship and plundered the seas. Hearing rumors of an alien artifact called the Time Decelerator, Mortimer traveled to Atlantis and confronted Aquaman about it because he believed that it was capable of making him immortal. He kidnapped Mera and Aqua Baby and poisoned the water in Atlantis, forcing Aquaman to help him find this new mysterious device. Funnily enough, he actually did end up finding the device, however, upon activating it, it regressed him in age until he stopped existing completely, forcing him to live in a limbo-like state for many, many years. He eventually was able to somehow make it back to his original age and size, and teamed up with Cobra for a while upon his return. Scavenger is later seen to have reformed and even becomes friends with Aquaman. Their last battle was over stolen cargo that turned out to be vaccines. Mortimer's conscience got the better of him and he was treated like a hero for the very first time as he helped deliver them safely. Aquaman helped him clean up his act and he even became a business owner. There's a little bit more to the story that gets just, you know, a little bit risque. So if you're feeling up to it, I'll let you check that out for yourself. So give his story a read starting with his first appearance in 1968's Aquaman number 37. And number one, King Pomoxis. One of the many corrupt Atlanteans, Pomoxis was one of just the worst, conspiring to straight up eliminate Aquaman for being the chosen hero. Pomoxis summoned Aquaman back to Poseidonus under the pretext of investigating a series of bizarre explosions taking place just outside the city. When the two went to investigate, Pomoxis pushed Aquaman into the path of a spiraling vortex, sending him backwards through time like oh, two and a half thousand years. Returning to Atlantis, Pomoxis assumed Aquaman's appearance and identity and told everyone that the real Pomoxis died in the explosions. With Aquaman's reputation, he was able to do pretty much anything and everything. However, he was eventually taken down by the real Aquaman after he returned to the present alongside Aqualad. A short time later, Pomoxis conspired with a pirate named Captain Clay and together they lured a pack of sea monsters to attack Atlantis. While Aquaman and Aqualad were distracted trying to keep the monsters away from the populated areas, Pomoxis took advantage of the situation and staged a coup against the Atlantean King Stamar. His first official act as the newly crowned king was to imprison Aquaman and Aqualad. However, that did not last long because our heroes were able to dethrone him and just take him down. Check out his four issue run for yourself starting with 1962's Aquaman number 3. Number 10. Mindworm. Mindworm, aka William Turner, but not the William Turner from Pirates of the Caribbean, is very powerful with his mind, allowing himself to read people's thoughts, drain people's energy, and create illusions. Mindworm has a very large head and brain that he was born with. At one time, he was neighbors to Flash Thompson and Peter Parker when he moved in with Flash. Since Mindworm was always feeding off people's minds, it was no surprise that he was trying to feed off of Peter's mind as well. But since Peter's so smart, he could fight off Mindworm's attack to his mind. This upset Mindworm, and he later fought Peter, but of course he was unsuccessful and lost. Mindworm used this as an opportunity to figure out why he was even doing this, and after taking a hard look at himself, and realizing that his anger was coming from what happened to his parents, he makes peace with Peter and he even uses his slogan, with great power comes great responsibility. Unfortunately, Mindworm's story doesn't end great since criminals manipulate him back to a life of crime and he went back to prison and afterwards he was killed by a group of people on the street. It's pretty depressing. Number nine, The Spot. So before he became The Spot, he was known as a guy named Jonathan, a scientist who was working for none other than Kingpin. Yes, so you know he has to be pretty evil working for a guy like Kingpin. Anyways, Kingpin wanted Jonathan to figure out a way to replicate Cloak's powers. Not such an easy task as Jonathan would soon find out. Instead, he opened up a portal that sent him into a spotted dimension. Huh, no 
I wonder if that's where he got his name from. When he was inside that dimension, his skin changed to where he had black spots all over bleached white skin. These spots were all around his entire body and would allow him to teleport to anything that he touches. He hated Spider-Man so much that he even formed a group with some of the people that will show up later on this list. Spoiler alert, one of them may be Grizzly or maybe Kangaroo. Maybe, but you'll have to keep watching to find out if that's true. But they were part of the Spider-Man Revenge Squad. Of course, you know, it didn't really work out for him. Number eight, The Living Brain. So the living brain was created by the character Dr. Petty and is basically an artificial intelligence robot machine. There was nothing that the living brain couldn't solve. So when it was brought to a high school, it gave two people a pretty good idea of what they could do with this crazy robot. They had the idea to steal it and use it for whatever they would go out and gamble. They attempted to steal it, but Dr. Petty didn't want to lose his creation and fought them off and caused one of them to hit the living brain, damaging it and causing it to lose control of itself. It then turned on everyone and was on a mission to destroy, but luckily Spider-Man defeated it and saved the day. The living brain has appeared several times after this by, you know, people either trying to use it to take down bullies or try to rob banks. The living brain was even part of the Sinister Six at one point. Number seven, Swarm. This is definitely a weird one. I mean, so are a lot of these ones on this list. So the Swarm was a Nazi scientist who survived World War II and was really into bees and poisons. He really wanted to try to make the bees he was finding very villainous and use them to his advantage. He discovered a beehive, and since he was trying to make them change their behavior, he was successful at doing that. But that is what ended up getting him killed by the bees and allowed the bees to use his consciousness and what was left of his body to become the swarm. He has the abilities to fly and even turn as big or as small as he likes. He can also manipulate himself into different shapes. This makes it very hard for Spider-Man to fight him since really he's just a swarm of bees. He also could control not only bees, but any type of insect. Number six, Leaf Frog. So Leapfrog, aka Vincent Patillo, loved to invent an assortment of just random items. He always wanted more though after every invention, and he was never really satisfied. That is, until he developed this invention so that he would be able to leap several stories in the air. He used this invention and created a suit to become the Leapfrog. This is how he began to get into the criminal world, but you know, he didn't have the greatest success there, and there's not a lot about him. Number five, Plant Man. Samuel Smithers was obsessed with plants and even studied them throughout his jobs. He wanted to invent a device that allowed communication between plants and humans. He had been working on this ray gun that he thought could actually make it work and create this open line of communication. It was only when it was hit by lightning when it actually got the ability to control plants. You know, he has superhuman strength and he has the ability to communicate and control plants. After he placed Captain America in a coma with his invention, Pretty Poison, he got the attention of Spider-Man, who teamed up with the Falcon to take down Plant Man and get the cure for Captain America. Number four, Grizzly. Maxwell Markham, aka Grizzly, is quite the strange supervillain. Basically, he looks like an actual grizzly bear in this mechanical suit. His story is that he used to be a wrestler until J. Jonah Jameson ruined his career with one article, which was the reason why he lost his license to be a pro wrestler. He wanted revenge on the man who ruined his career and later attacked the Daily Bugle. Spider-Man showed up and was able to take down Grizzly and sent him straight to prison. Grizzly had super strength, durability, and super sharp claws. Number three, Kangaroo. Before Frank Oliver became the Kangaroo, he was just some guy who loved studying Kangaroo back at his home of Australia. He used to be a boxer, but he got kicked out for how he fought and really hurt one of his other opponents. When he made his way over to America, he got quite into trouble and even caught the eye of Spider-Man, since Kangaroo had stolen an armored truck, but Spider-Man was able to apprehend him. Kangaroo later got surgery by Dr. Jonas Harrow, and this is what gave him his powers where he could actually leap like a kangaroo, but a lot higher and much further. Apparently, even before his surgery, he did have kind of some abilities where he could leap more so than the average human, but not to the extent of what the surgery gave him. Number two, Big Wheel. Jackson Wheel, AKA Big Wheel, got the tinkerer to make him this big armored wheel that would you know, lead him to become the Big Wheel. This all started because Rocket Racer, someone he hired to find any dirt on himself, 
wanted more money for something extremely bad that he found on Wheel. Something that would ruin his entire job in life. He found out about the Tinkerer from Rocket Racer, which led him to the creation of the Armored Wheel. He attacked Rocket Racer during a fight with Spider-Man. He almost killed Rocket Racer, but Spider-Man saved him and then Big Wheel lost control, went into the river, and was later arrested and sent to prison. But don't worry, he was back to a life of crime shortly after that. They always do. Number 1. The Wall Yes, there was a supervillain named The Wall that has gone up against Spider-Man in the past. And a little fun story, I remember hearing about this villain a few years ago from my friend who was going back and he was reading all the original Amazing Spider-Man issues. I remember he sent me a picture while he was reading it and I literally could not stop laughing because his slogan was, this is one wall you will never crawl. I mean, it's weird, but at the same time, it's kind of amazing. Like, he's definitely one of the most weird and just strange supervillains that Spider-Man has ever gone up against. Okay, so a little backstory. Joshua Waldemeyer, <laughs> wow, had the job of laying bricks down, and one day, an explosion happened and hit a brick wall that had just been built, sending it crashing down and burying him under all these bricks, but didn't kill him. And actually, the bricks merged with his body, which turned him into the wall wall. Since he was an actual wall, Spider-Man had a hard time affecting him with any and all physical attacks. Spider-Man's web attacks didn't even work on him, but they later found themselves sitting on a bench and just working things out like two grown adults. A grown man spider and a grown man wall. Number 10, Apocalypse. While you likely know Apocalypse, who has been in many mutant themed comics as well as animated series and even an X Men film, you might not recall the time that Thor and Apocalypse faced one another. That's right, these two have beef, and it actually goes way, way back. We learned about their first fight in a flashback in Rick Remender's Uncanny Avengers issue number 6. Here we learn that the two came to blows more than a thousand years in the past, after Apocalypse had learned that Thor would be the one to stop him in the future. Apocalypse tracks down a younger Thor, who is not yet worthy of Mjolnir, and instead wields his axe known as Yarnbjorn. Unsurprisingly, during this first fight, Thor would be defeated by Apocalypse and was forced to retreat. But this would not be the end of their feud for the two enemies, and they would of course come to blows again later on in their lives, as was predicted. Number 9. Mangog Mangog is a villain who embodies and carries within itself the rage of their entire race, which was destroyed by Odin. We don't really know why Odin and Asgard decided to eliminate this race of beings, but they did. And so Mangog came to existence as the physical manifestation of that race's hatred towards all things Asgardian. This hate obviously extended to Thor. This has prompted the two to clash over the years. Oftentimes, Mangog is too strong to be defeated in battle, however, the being feeds off of psychic energies, and if one can cut it off from its source of hatred, which fuels Mangog, it could easily be defeated. Number 8. Gladiator Gladiator always tends to show up to fight Thor in the most random stories. Once such story even sees him taking on the all new Thor, Jane Foster's Thor, when the Shi'ar gods decide they would like to prove their worth by defeating her in the Challenge of the Gods. In order to get her to compete, they decide to send the Imperial Guard, Gladiator included, to kidnap her. The Imperial Guard fought against the Asgardians, but were defeated. In the end, Gladiator did decide to team up with Thor to take down the Shi'ar gods, who kinda were taking out their wrath on the Shi'ar people. This led to Quentin Quire becoming the new god of Shi'ar, which is, yeah, pretty random. Random stories like this where Gladiator would be pulled into strange conflicts with Thor, Jane Foster, or Thor Odinson appear to be a recurring thing in the comics. Number 7. Tomorrow Man Speaking of weird storylines involving conflict between Gladiator and Thor, Archer Zarko was also involved in one such similar conflict. Zarko is known as the Tomorrow Man, an evil scientist from the future who first came into conflict with Thor when he traveled to the past in order to more easily acquire a nuclear bomb. This prompted Thor himself to time travel in order to pursue Tomorrow Man. Later on, Zarko would also recruit Gladiator from an alternate future to fight and defeat Thor. Speaking of that feud that those two had previously. Number 6. Ragnarok For those who cannot see the sometimes dramatic similarities between the superhero genre and soap operas, by the way, this is one of them. Ragnarok is Thor's evil clone. He was created using a strand of Thor's hair that Iron Man had found. Or so Tony claims. I definitely think he was pulling out strands of Thor's hair while he slept, or just pulled some out of his hairbrush super sneakily. But no, the story is he just found a hair of Thor's and decided to keep it, just in case. 
In case of what, Tony? In case of what? This, of course, later led to the creation of Ragnarok and the use of him during the events of the first Civil War, when Thor would not join with Iron Man and Stark decided to use this one hair he happened to be saving to create a clone of Thor to basically rally and inspire the troops. Ragnarok would appear to perish at the hands of Hercules, but would later return once more and even join Norman Osborn's Dark Avengers during the events of Dark Reign. Number 5. Curse Also known as Algim, Curse is one of the strongest dark elves around. He at one point allied himself with Malekith and while he often lacks the direction, intelligence and depth to really become a standout villain when it comes to his interactions with the Thunder God, he is still likely one of the more powerful of Thor's villains. Curse only served Malekith for a time as well as he later found himself betrayed by Malekith, causing him to break ties with the other dark elf. The Beyonder also bolstered Curse's power levels, increasing them using his own cosmic energy, after sensing and being attracted to Curse's intense hatred for Thor. The Beyonder of course just gave him a power boost for funsies cause well he's kind of chaotic like that. Number 4. Desok the Destroyer of Gods Desok was a villain who originally started out as a pretty kind hearted and pious man. He became a villain after feeling that the sacrifice of his daughter to his gods had not really been justified. Losing his faith in the gods as his people were attacked, he decided to accept godlike powers that were offered to him so he could avenge his and people's losses. So he could avenge his and his people's losses. Desok set out to kill the gods and was predicted to be the one who would also strike down the gods of Olympus in due time. As such, Thor set out to stop Desak before he could arrive, venturing out into space with Hercules and Beta Ray Bill. Number 3. The Enchanters 3 The Enchanters 3 were brothers who were also masterful sorcerers. They each were armed with their own living talisman, which amplifies their magical powers. And their names were Forsung, Brona, and Magner. Yep, they certainly sound like they could be Thor villains just based on those names. These brothers decided one day that they just wanted to conquer conquer Asgard after running into the warriors and Thor's companions Baldur and Sif. When Baldur and Sif caught on, they rushed down to earth to warn Thor of the Enchantress' plot. Thor teams up with his fellow Asgardians, including Odin, and manages to defeat the Enchantress, slaying one of them and trapping the other two in an alternate dimension. It's also later revealed that the brothers actually had a fourth sibling named Enrocked. And following this revelation, we also learn that his formerly trapped brothers are free and have also returned, prompting Thor to once again take on these magical foes. Although having a fourth brother kind of ruins the whole Enchanters 3 name, but I guess because one of them was dead it still works because now there's still three? Number 2. Bloodaxe the Executioner Bloodaxe is a villain who basically gets all of her powers from a mystical Asgardian axe, which grants its user power but also corrupts them. It was once wielded by Scourge the Executioner and as such is imbued with evil energy that also compels whoever wields it to kill, eventually driving them into an insane bloodlust. Bloodaxe wielded this power to kill low level criminals indiscriminately and as such attracted the attention of Thor. Oddly enough, while Jackie Lucas, Bloodaxe's civilian identity first appeared in the late 80s in the Thor comics, she would not appear as Bloodaxe until more than 50 issues later. She also originally wore Scourge's armor during her first appearance as Bloodaxe, in addition to wielding the enchanted axe itself. Number 1. Quicksand Quicksand was a pretty random villain who first appeared in Thor issue 392. She was originally a human who was transformed into a sand elemental creature due to a nuclear accident. So basically she's female sand. Man. As such, she holds a pretty big grudge against nuclear power, which seems to have been trendy to do in the 80s as there was also a protest going on at the power plant she attacked at the time that she attacked it. This comic was likely reflecting the opinion of the times as the Chernobyl disaster would have only happened a couple of years prior to this issue's release. It came out in 1988 and the disaster at Chernobyl happened in 1986. History People at the time were likely afraid of nuclear reactors and the dangers of having a power plant nearby due to the relatively recent and severe disaster that had happened. Quicksand as such attacks the power plant, blaming nuclear energy for her mutation, when Thor comes along and stops her. Oddly enough, this wouldn't be the last we'd see of Quicksand either in the comics, or even the last time we'd see her fight Thor. Still, she's pretty obscure. <laughs>